Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 28th meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. The usual story, please, as far as your mobile phones are concerned. Uh, the first item on the agenda today is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's Legislative Consent Memorandum in respect of the EU Withdrawal Bill, which is currently being considered by the UK Parliament. We are joined for this item by Michael Russell, the Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's Place in Europe. <coughs> And Mr Russell is today accompanied by Scottish Government officials Ian Davidson and Luke McBratney. Uh, the Minister um, gave evidence on the 20th of September and since then we've taken evidence from a range of witnesses including lawyers, academics and, and UK ministers and other stakeholders. And I, I don't think the Minister wants today to make an opening statement so we'll just get straight down to questions. Ash Denham. Thank you convener. Good morning. Obviously, we know that the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government put forward joint amendments to the UK Government with regard to the EU Withdrawal Bill. So can you um, give us an idea of what progress has been made regarding the amendments particularly? Well, the amendments are uh, due for debate. This, the, the issue of devolution in the Withdrawal Bill is due for debate next week, uh, Monday, in the House of Commons. Uh, clearly, we will have to see how that goes. Um, I think I should make it clear that we cannot agree, and, and I know the Welsh Government's position is the same because I had a, a meeting with my Welsh counterpart, Mark Drakeford, in Dublin on Friday morning. Um, we cannot agree to move forward on this unless the bill is amended. Uh, I think, you know, and I'll talk later on about the progress we're making in terms of uh, the frameworks and the formal discussions, but a sine qua non of this is for the bill to be amended and for uh, Clause 11 particularly to be either removed or changed by amendment. Uh, and without that, we cannot complete the progress and we cannot bring a legislative consent motion. Uh, that is uh, where things are. So we will know next week. There are, of course, other opportunities for amendment and, um, you know, um, the Proceedings of the House of Commons are, compared to the proceedings of our own Parliament, a little arcane. So there are other ways to, to do this, and perhaps the amendment will come at a later stage. But Monday is quite crucial, and we need to have an assurance from the UK government, clear, categorical assurance from the UK government, that change will come. So um, the Secretary of State for Scotland, David Mundell, was in front of the committee, as you'll probably be aware, a couple of weeks ago. Um, he said that there was very detailed ongoing discussions taking place between officials um, to look particularly at the amendments. I'm just wondering if you're able to confirm any details that that is ongoing or comment on it at all. Well, the discussion has taken place. Uh, there has been a detailed and, and uh, I think, positive discussion. But the, the ball is very much in the UK government's court. Uh, they know the position that the two administrations have taken. They know the changes that we require to see. Of course, if there are other changes that they want to bring which are consistent with those objectives, then, of course, we will discuss those. I'm endeavouring to keep the political parties informed by means of discussions with individuals, including uh, you know, Mr Tompkins has been at some of those discussions, and uh, we'll, we are involving all the parties in those discussions. But we've never made any secret of the fact there have to be changes. So obviously there's been progress made on the common frameworks. Do you think that the fact that progress has been made there is kind of overshadowing the fact that maybe no progress has been made on the bill? Well, they are operating on two different timetables. I mean, they're co-joined, but they are two different timetables. And of course, the opportunity for change comes at the amending stage of the bill or amending stages of the bill. So the, the, we are getting close to the first such opportunity. I, I, you know, I'm absolutely happy to accept the assurances that I have from a range of people that uh, that work is ongoing, but we have to see some fruits of it. Uh, Damien Green is in Scotland tomorrow and we'll be meeting with the Deputy First Minister and myself and this will be a point that we will make uh, very clearly to him. Okay, <coughs> thank you, Minister. I just wonder if you could give us your view on how likely you think the success of the amendments that will be debated in the House of Commons will be on Monday. Um, and if that doesn't, if that's not successful, what the Scottish Government's strategy there is, is thereafter? Because I think we're all keen to find a solution here. I think there's a general view as well that, that obviously Clause 11 has to be amended in some way, if not disappear entirely. And therefore, um, any, any information you could give us that we could help with that, I think, would be useful. I think this is a matter for the UK government now. We, you know, we've made our position entirely clear. Uh, if the UK government has alternative amendments that they think would serve the same purpose, we are absolutely open to those discussions. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I can't speak for the, the Welsh government, but I think, I think I'm confident in saying that they would be in the same position on that. 
Uh, but they have to decide what they're going to do. Now, if on Monday there is these amendments are not accepted, that would be the first, I suppose, there's a series of branch diagrams here. You know, if the amendments were accepted, that concludes the matter, and we, we move on, and we, that's done. If the amendments are not accepted um, and are put to a vote and, and, and succeed, that's it done. Uh, if the amendments are put to a vote and fail and are defeated by the UK government, then we need to know what the UK government intends to do next. Is that a conclusion of the matter? Are they going to proceed with the bill unchanged? Are they going to bring forward further amendments? Are they, you know, have they a view on what those amendments should be? So you know, we are almost, as is ever, in, in, I'm afraid, in the Brexit issue, it is a step at a time. You know, it is testing the ground and seeing what's next. But I would, I would hope because I'm always an optimist, that they would see the sense of these amendments and accept them. Do I expect that to happen? Well, I'd like it to happen. Okay. Adam. Thank you, Camille. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. Um, I, I want to try and focus on um, solutions to what I'm going to call the Clause 11 problem. I mean, we, I think everybody around the committee table you know, fully understands the Scottish Government's position. And as you know, we've taken evidence from you know, UK ministers in two different departments to try and understand the UK Government's position too. So, I, you know, rather than going over that ground, <clears throat> um, I, I'd like to just tr try and you know, peer a little bit more. One might even say do a deep dive in, in, into, in, into, what the, into what the solutions are. So, uh, I, I, can I take it that, um, that you agree, and the Scottish Government agrees, that there is likely to be a solution uh, in and around common frameworks? Yes. I, I'm only hesitating because there cannot be a solution if... Clause 11 remains unchanged. You know, frameworks in and of themselves are not going to produce a solution. They are they are necessary part of the solution, but they're not sufficient to produce the solution. So, um, that, that's helpful. Do you think that Clause 11 will need to be amended to reflect to reflect the existence of such frameworks? Well, that is that would be a possibility. But mm. the, the main objection to Clause 11 is, of course, that it changes the, de the devolved settlement, or at least our objection to it is that it changes the devolved settlement. Um, we do not accept that change. So if uh, the Secretary of State for Scotland is to be believed, and I'm sure he is to be believed, that this should be done by agreement, not by imposition, then Clause 11 it, it, it still has a, an element of imposition in it. So that would have to be changed. Secretary of State's position, um, he's made this very clear both in House of Commons committees and here, um, is that all 111 of the powers identified in that Cabinet Office list um, uh, will be exercised after exit day, either by this Parliament or subject to a common framework to which the Scottish Government is a party. It, I'm speculating, mm -hmm. but if Clause 11 were to be amended to reflect that position, would that satisfy you? I would want to see, now I don't want to be difficult with you, but I would want mm -hmm. to see the wording on that. Of course. That would, be, that would be a step forward from where we are now. I mean, you know, we have one means of amending this, which essentially expunges you know, the, the issue of Clause 11. If there is another solution to it, which uh, accepts that uh, any changes take place by consent, then I think that that would be something which we would be willing to discuss, and I think we'll remain willing to discuss, and I always have been willing to discuss. On, on the detail of this, Minister, um, Professor Rick Rawlings, um, uh, in our last evidence session, suggested this, that in place of Clause 11, there might be included a power, and I'm quoting from his evidence, to add, remove, or modify reservations in the devolved settlements to reflect frameworks. Th that would presumably be done by a Section 30 procedure that would require... Um, the consent not just of Scottish ministers but of the Scottish Parliament. Is that, is that the sort of thing that you would well, be prepared uh, again, to, to look at? I, again, I can see the way in which that might operate successfully mm -hmm. and would meet our objections in terms of imposition. And I think that's the key issue. Uh, this has to be negotiated and agreed. It cannot be imposed. So if any amend set, amendment or set of amendments were to come forward that removed the imposition and made sure that the, this was done and could only be done by agreement, uh, then I think we we would be in the pro we would be more than willing to discuss those amendments. I of course can't make a hard no, no, of course. acceptance, but no. I, I think there is a an opening there. Although I would you know counter that by saying our amendments would be preferred, and we prefer the route we are taking on this. Yeah, I, I understand that. That's very helpful. Final question for from me. Uh, the, 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 I I have to say I'm still not entirely satisfied in my own mind that I know what a common framework will look like when I see one. I, I haven't seen one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
how can you help the committee understand y y y your your thinking on you know how they will be um, constructed and how they will be policed and enforced in the event that there is a a breach or what mm -hmm. looks to one party like a breach of a common framework somewhere down the line in the future well that's precisely the work that's underway i mean i think first of all there isn't one standard common framework there will be a degree of different arrangements some of which will replicate what we already have in some areas which is the ability to work together uh, uh, you know a slightly unusual one which i dredged from my memory the other day uh, from my time as environment minister is the 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 solution that was found to the solway and esk issue where there are two different administrations, of course, that are administering uh, rivers that cross the border. Now, you know, I'm not saying this is a template, but it's simply one way in which a contentious and difficult solution uh, situation was solved at the time of devolution. There will be different types of, of, of arrangements come to. But the work of the deep dive, and, and Ian Davison has just surfaced after more of, of deep diving, uh, the work of the deep dive has been to identify, first of all, the proof of concept. Could it be done on you know, looking at the specific details of one or two areas and then saying, could we devise a, a system of governance round that which accepted, uh, and this is you know, the, the, the word that would also need to, need to be fleshed out, the, the co-decision making that we would have to be involved in, that there was a confidence that we could reach decisions um, in a way that would, would be binding um, on all of us. And that work is also, I think, moderately successful. So now we move having gone from principles to proof of concept to uh, governance and dispute resolution, what we need to do is to take those three to two more stages. One is political agreement on the subjects covered out of the list of 111, and finally their conversion into legislation should that be required, either through the, the macro Clause 11, solving the Clause 11 problem, or the micro, in a sense, embedding, for example, in the Agriculture Bill. So you know, I, I would have thought out of those five pieces of progress that we need, we're probably reasonably well down the road on three of them. The other two require the action. Now, Damien Green's here tomorrow, so maybe we'll make some progress on that, uh, and then they need to be converted into action. So I'm, I'm moderately confident that this is going the right direction, but unless we resolve the Clause 11 issue, then you know, it's either all agreed or nothing's agreed. I, 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 I understand that, but just on the final a point there, and your your fifth finger, <laughs> um, the uh, you know the, the the legislative issues. You 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 are content, um, in principle. Of course, you won't see the detail, but you're content in principle that a number of these common frameworks might need to be reflected in legislation. I, I've always said that there will be a need to reflect some, one or more of the common frameworks in legislation. Uh, Agriculture is the obvious one, because there's an agriculture bill, and we'll see how it happens. It wouldn't be automatic. I mean, I can imagine them operating without that, but there is a potential for that happening. Thank you. Um, Marcel, let me just pick up some of the nuances of the discussion you just had with Adam there, because in relation to the evidence from Rick Rawlings, I think your answer was quite interesting. Um, and obviously, all of the Scottish Government's position, rightly, is centred around consent and agreement. So when we consent and agree, to, or when the Scottish government consents and agree to things, you can then move forward. I understand that. But Professor Rollins talked about other circumstances in which you could countenance alterations to Schedule Five, which expand the scope of reserve competence. Um, there's a, and that's what Adam was referring to in his question. Does that mean that the reality behind the scenes and the nuance of this is where it's, it's important? Actually, means while. The, the UK government might be able to legislate in um, areas which are devolved if we agreed these, rather than it being a situation where things are reserved. Well, I can conceive of that happening, but let's be straightforward about the principle of devolution. I, I'm not willing to undermine the principle of devolution, right? So that lies there as the core principle, which is you know reserved and devolved, a clarity between those. These are a different set of circumstances we're in. They're an unexpected, they're an unwelcome set of circumstances in which we're in. So it is Im incumbent upon us to negotiate and to discuss, but we're not going to undermine the devolution settlement. So you know, we're not going to accept anything. And you know, Again, I think this is a position that Wales has found itself in. We're not going to accept anything that creates circumstances in which either we are unclear about what is reserved or de devolved, 
or we're in a situation where uh, new reservations are imposed upon us. So that's clear. Um, the rest of it is for negotiation, of course, because we're trying to find a legislative solution to a complex problem. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that that, that mm -hmm. news is drawn out. Patrick. Thanks very much. Good morning. Uh, uh, just to um, explore this a bit further, the, the, the question to me that still seems unanswered is whether there is a, a, a belief that the, either that the UK government asserts or that the Scottish government implacably rejects that a common framework requires a single decision-making level. Um, the, the example that was used uh, in one of the evidence sessions uh, from, from some of our witnesses was on marine planning where there are a mixture of reserved but many devolved areas, uh, where there was a, a process of consultation at both legislative levels, stakeholder engagement, parliamentary scrutiny, and separate legislation in the two legislatures. Does that arrive at something that deserves to be called a common framework, uh, given that if there was divergence in the future, uh, that would be permissible. It would, it would not be something that Adam yep. Tompkins called a breach. Uh, it would, might be unfortunate or unhelpful, but it would be divergence, which is legitimate within the, 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 the current I, I, I absolutely concur with your view that this is not and should not be seen as a means of imposing uniformity on the agreed devolved settlement. You know, that is not what it is about. It is about dealing with the interfaces that have been created as a result of the Brexit process, uh, which are have not occurred before, and which require a resolution. But it, you know, in the example you gave, the, the established example which you gave, um, only those areas where there is presently EU competence being exercised, um, and there is a dispute of some sort about where that competence should lie um, after Brexit, should it take place, would the question arise of whether there should be a framework. If the existing uh, operation works and works well, as it, you know, marine planning is a very good example of that, there is an entirely clear um, uh, set of arrangements for marine planning. There are a range of organisations involved, and there are established uh, ways of dealing with any dispute or conflict that arises. I don't think that that would, for a moment, suggest to me that there should be a, a, um, a, a framework in there. So Mundell is still saying to you what he said to us, which is that he wants to have a, a process of agreeing where there would be common frameworks, but that doesn't necessarily mean agreement about the contents of common frameworks, then we have a problem. Well, yes, uh, let's start with the list of 111 points. If something's not on the list of 111 points, it is by definition out of sc scope and consideration. It's not, it's not there. You know, if we were to start to see things added to the list of 111, you know, this, this whole thing is doomed. Uh, we can't make any progress at all. So we start with a list of 111. Moreover, we pair that list back. I mean, that's been you know, something that has been much under discussion. We don't accept that anything should be on that list, to be blunt. Uh, they should all be coming back here. But in the process of this negotiation and discussion, uh, if items were to fall off that list because there is no interest in them, uh, I think the example that was... Uh, uh, was used by Adam Tompkins, actually, in his article, was aircraft noise, if I remember correctly. I'm a keen student of what um, Mr. Tompkins writes. Uh, the, aircraft, the aircraft noise issue was, is exactly the point there. There's no reason why that should be included in any of these frameworks, because it is perfectly possible to exercise it uh, under existing legislation and powers, and we just have to say, well, that power, the competence coming back, goes directly to uh, Scotland. So we take those out of the list. We are left with a range of issues which will require further resolution. Now, our, our initial approach to that is they all come here. The UK government's initial approach to that is they all are reserved. Somewhere in the middle there, in shared frameworks operating under co-decision making, there may be a solution. And we, we, you know, we, and we recognised that last year in the Scotland's Place in Europe paper. You know, we're, we're not, we're, we're not, we've not changed our position on that. Thank you. Alexander? Uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, just to take you back to the, uh, the principles of the common frameworks um, and the statement of principles agreed by the JMC. I won't read them out in full, but you know, enable the function of the internal market, uh, compliance of international obligations, uh, new trade agreements, uh, management of common resources, etc. Uh, can you just uh, talk a bit more about how these principles were arrived at uh, and were they co-produced by uh, the UK government and yourselves uh, or were they pre just presented to you? 
No, um, we were presented with an initial list, and, and our position was that we found that un initial list unacceptable. It didn't, <coughs> it didn't recognize the principles of devolution, essentially. And that was a classic process of negotiation. Um, officials uh, undertook to some fairly heavy-duty um, negotiation over a period of time to come to a set of principles which we could agree. Uh, and those are the principles you know, which are now in front of you as... Uh, uh, as part of the, the process. Now, what we then did, I think quite interestingly, is when we agreed these at the last JMC on the 16th of October, um, my own view was, and, and I made that clear, that they should then be published. And they were appended to the communique, I think, uh, uh, and by agreement of the meeting, so that they were clear. Uh, and similarly, you know, we'll try to keep doing that as we go forward. The next JMC is on the 12th of December. And again, I would want to make sure that we're being entirely clear about what we're doing. Now, we have this established. These are the principles which we're working. We then need to make sure that we are uh, illustrating the proof of concept which has taken place. And I hope by then we might be able to illustrate the governance issues. So we'll build this up. And this is, this is partly confidence building, too, uh, you know, generally between the partners who are negotiating uh, and also in the public. So people understand there are some firm, clear foundations being put down here. Uh, thank you. So would you, would you go as far to say that the uh, JMC is being much more uh, constructive than previously? Well, it depends what you measure it from. Um, you know, the baseline's quite low. Uh, we had, you know, we, 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 I think we worked very hard to try and get the JMC up and running. Uh, last year, uh, it was disappointing when it stopped meeting. Uh, it broke, you know, the UK government broke the agreement that we had to meet monthly and broke the agreement to, the, to be the means by which we would try and seek agreement on the Article 50 letter. I have at this committee before paid tribute to Damien Green and his effort to get it going again. One of the things that has changed is the membership. The JMC was a very uh, unwieldy instrument. I, I'm, I never tire of telling the story of the JMC Europe I attended in 2009, in which I think there were 21 UK ministers, myself and Rodri Morgan. You know, it's, it wasn't exactly balanced. On this occasion, uh, there was the Secretary of State, uh, the first Secretary, the Secretary of State for exiting the EU and the three territorial Secretaries of State, and that was it. Plus, on the other side of the table, myself and Mark Drakeford. That was a better dynamic. And I have to say, you know, Damien Green chaired it in a way that created a better dynamic. And that allowed us to make help, at least was one of the factors that allows us to make this progress. Now, we are committed to that process. So are the Welsh. Is the UK government committed to the process? Good. I'm sorry that Northern Ireland isn't there. I think that's a major loss to the process. And I was in Northern Ireland um, uh, on Friday and Saturday uh, last week. And it does seem to me that, that is, uh, there's a need for participation. I had a meeting late on Friday afternoon with across community organisations and businesses and a very strong view that they should be there and their voice should be heard. Uh, but we will endeavour to continue to build confidence in that process. Thank you. Ivan. Uh, thanks, convener, and uh, thanks, uh, Minister, for coming along and talking to us this morning. Um, I just want to follow up on the issues around about the, um, the common frameworks, and it's something that um, Patrick Harvey kind of touched on. Uh, when the Secretary of State was here, he talked about, uh, and this is in relation to the, the LCM, um, he talked about if we, if we get, uh, in his view, if we got to the stage where we'd agreed what the process for agreeing was, that was sufficient progress, rather than actually agreeing to agree. Um, and I think on your five steps, I think that kind of gets us to probably about step three and a half, but I'm not, not exactly sure. So I just wanted your reflection on if, if you agree with that um, perception of how we reach agreement or... What if you disagree? Well, the, the words "sufficient progress" have a, a, another and, and separate meaning in in this in the lexicon of Brexit. So I'll be careful about how they're used. This is not a circumstance in which uh, this process simply moves forward because we have sufficient progress. This is a, these are a set of discussions in which we need to get to a conclusion because there is an end point. There is an end point both in objective and in time. You know, the end point and objective is to get the bill, you know, passed in a way that can be given legislative consent uh, so that we can move on from where we are. The objective in time is to do that before, you know, the bill is actually through. So we've got to achieve that. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that we simply, you know, we're talking about talks or, or seeking to find ways, you know, to agree about agreements. We've got an objective to meet here. And it's a question of how we get to that objective now. We've, we've done it methodically, and that's the right way to do it. We've done it by agreeing principles. We're now doing it by, in terms of proof of concept. We suggested that we looked at 
you know, a number of areas to see if we could work out how frameworks would work. Uh, we're now looking at it in terms of governance and, and, and dispute resolution. Uh, we then need to see it within the, the wider context of, of, uh, of how we uh, relate to each other through the bill and the changes to the bill, and finally that has to be uh, expressed in legislation. So I'm just keen that we keep moving along that path. And tomorrow's <coughs> meeting with the First Secretary and then the next JMC will be further aspects of that. Uh, we'll reflect upon the experience that Ian and his colleagues have had of the deep dive process, and I hope we'll be able to cement something in. But it's step by step towards an agreement. That's what we object our objective is. So we, we, could, <coughs> Sorry. That's okay. we, we, we could be in a situation there where we, we have agreed what common frameworks look like, and we've agreed the process for guarantee you like, but we haven't actually nailed down what the detail of the specifics are, but that, well, would, be I, I, that would be sufficient. I think, I think if we have confidence that we can see how they work, and that's proof of concept plus governance and, and dispute resolution, that'll be fine. But nothing is agreed until all is agreed in this. You know, the, the key that turns this lock is quite complex because it's got to have you know, trust and belief that these will work, but it's got to have physical change to the bill. You know, so those things have to both happen. And if at the end of this process those things haven't happened, then there will not be an agreement. Uh, that means that there will be no legislative consent motion, and it may mean that we bring forward a continuity bill. You know, so so we have we have options within this, but we are committed to this process. Okay, and, and I suppose my final point then is exactly that. If there's a failure to agree, where does that leave us? Well, I mean, we've we've made clear, and the Welsh have made clear, that the, the, the less desirable option, but it still exists, is a continuity bill. It's legislation here. Uh, that'll be hard work. Uh, it, it, you know, there are difficulties in it, but if it has to be, it has to be. But, uh, you know, we, we can resolve this as long as there's an understanding that the bill has to change, and as long as we continue to make progress on the, the discussions we're having. And, you know, the official discussions, you know, have been positive, and the progress is being made in them. Uh, and that is a good thing because, you know, there were a periods during this year when official discussion was producing nothing of any description. So that's good. Thank you. Can I just tease that out a bit more as well, Minister? Because at the end of this, there will be a final piece of the jigsaw has to fit in place before agreement can be reached and everything's got to be agreed before we can get agreement. Uh, and I, I guess that final piece of the jigsaw will be that conflict resolution issue because... If, and while the Secretary of State said that there, he was, he, think, he, he thought agreement should be reached by consent and what the process was about, that's different to the actual content, as Patrick picked up in earlier, of the actual frameworks. So that's, that final piece of the jigsaw needs to be in place, I think, not just to give the Scottish Government some assurance, but this committee some assurance that that issue is resolved. Uh, uh, um, so where are we getting to with that conflict well, resolution issue? My view is that you build your way towards these by building confidence and trust in the process. So that as we discuss these things, we're doing it on the basis that we trust each other that we'll get an outcome uh, that is acceptable. Uh, that process is ongoing. <coughs> there have been discussions this week on, con on dispute resolution and governance. Um, we will reflect upon the outcomes of those over the next few days, uh, and certainly in our discussions with Damien Green tomorrow, I would be happy to have a further conversation with you when we know when where those are. I suppose the next key date is the JMC on the 12th, uh, at which I think we would seek to, to make some progress on these. So if on the 12th we can come out with some agreement on what the next steps are, happy to report that to you. But um, we're not there yet, so I'm not going to make overclaim about what the situation is. But you're right to say that's a key element. Just as getting the principles was a key element, just as proof of concept was a key element. These are all things that fit in step by step. Yeah, but that'll be the last piece of the jigsaw probably that'll fit into place. Well, the last piece of the jigsaw will actually be converting all of that into... Uh, the last piece of the jigsaw will be converting all that into legislation, into an amendment to, to the bill that is acceptable to all of us. Um, you know, this is... This is all without prejudice to the outcome of negotiations. You know, you know we're... We're doing our best, and we're also very happy to talk about it. We don't believe it should be secret, but equally, I can't say at the, preci the precise moment at which that will happen. Okay, and let me just 
go a bit further than that, if you don't mind. Uh, the, 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 I guess the question I really want to ask, and I'm not sure I should ask it so directly, but I'm going to, is if at the end of this process, and there is no resolution to finding how, how, about how we find out, sort out the fine words of these frameworks, and there is no resolution to the conflict resolution, does that mean that you can't recommend an LCM to the... Yeah. yeah just because I think that's important. This committee needs to know that, and I'll, uh, just clearly for the record, because we'll have to take a view on it ourselves about how important that last piece of the jigsaw is. We will not, I mean, I'm, I'm happy convened, but absolutely on the record, we will not recommend an LCM unless we are convinced, firstly, that we have frameworks and a structure will work, and that secondly, the amendments to the bill will meet our objectives. Um, that takes me to Neil. Mr. Convener, good morning, Minister. Um, <coughs> we've heard evidence that, uh, despite assurances to the contrary, the Scottish Government routinely relies upon UK subordinate legislation in the transposition of EU obligations without this Parliament being kept informed, let alone asked for its consent. Um, if the UK Government was to concede that the consent of Scottish Ministers was to be sought before UK Ministers made any amendments to the Scotland Act or other legislation, within devolved competence, what assurance can you and the Scottish Government give the committee that will inform the Parliament before it consents to such amendments and consider seeking parliamentary approval? I gave that assurance at the last meeting, Mr Bibby. I'm happy to give it again now. That's what we will do. Uh, I, not only did I give the assurance the last time, but I also said we wanted to set up a mechanism to make sure that you know, we didn't exercise our own powers um, until you know, we, had, we had consulted. Now, I believe that discussion is ongoing with the Parliament. Um, I'm very keen that it reaches a, 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 a conclusion, but I have no wish to, 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 to take on powers that are allocated to us um, and simply to, to exercise them in the way that I believe they shouldn't be exercised at Westminster. There are amendments to the withdrawal bill that will give effect to changes at the UK level on that. We will at the very minimum mirror those, but I intend to go further to make sure that there's, there's an agreement between the Parliament and the government about how we do that. Thank you for that assurance. Thank you. Willie. Thanks very much, uh, Minister. I could I ask about Clause 7 in particular? It, it, it protects the Northern Ireland Act, but there's no such protection for the Scotland and Wales Act. Has there been any progress in your discussions about that, or is it in the basket of, of uh, asks and amendments that well, we can look forward to? There, it is in the basket of asks and amendments. There are particularly, diffi particularly difficulties in terms of Northern Ireland, as we know. And we should always be conscious of the fact that we're not drawing an exact parallel with Northern Ireland, and we don't draw an exact parallel with Northern Ireland. Uh, but clearly, uh, protection for the Northern Ireland Act and no protection of the Scotland and Wales Acts is, is not equitable treatment. Uh, and there are issues that need to, need to be uh, addressed in there. I mean, it shouldn't be taken that we approve of the withdrawal, all the parts of the withdrawal bill that we've not sought to amend. That would be a misreading of our position. We've been very careful about saying what we want to amend because the process of amendment is for Westminster MPs to undertake and they are the people who will discuss, for example, the, the, the European Charter is an, a Westminster issue. I would want to see it maintained. I'm sorry the vote did not follow through on that. The areas we've focused on are the ones which, are, which we believe produce a threat to the devolved settlement and therefore we want to change them. But the other areas we look to Westminster MPs to amend and to object to, and you know our own SNP MPs have done that, Labour MPs are doing it, uh, Liberal uh, MPs are doing it, and some Tories are doing it from time to time. So you know there is a there is a fairly widespread opposition to some parts of the bill. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of the the Seoul Convention, the, the Secretary of State when he came to see us said he was quite happy to talk about extending that to cover. Secondary legislation, they said that, is on record as saying that. How, how should that commitment be put in place if that's a genuine offer to do I that? I think that exists in Wales, doesn't it, because of the legislative processes in Wales. Mm. We'd be very happy to enter into constructive discussions with the Secretary of State at any stage uh, about changes to that process. That would involve the Parliament, I think, very heavily rather than the government. Um, but, of course, we should have those conversations. Okay. Thank you. Emma Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning. Um, you mentioned that you were in Ireland over the weekend, and uh, I know that the border in Ireland continues to be a, a huge sticking point. And, I mean, for me in my area, Cairn Ryan is the third largest ferry port, so is there any progress in the border? And is there, if there is, how would it help or hinder us in Scotland? 
Well, we, we have to be careful in you know, discussing this issue because clearly, again, we don't draw exact parallels of any description. But I was in Dublin on Friday morning um, to speak at an event uh, in, in the very beautiful Royal Irish Academy in, in, in Dawson Street. And I had a series of meetings, uh, including with the British Irish Chamber of Commerce, who've, if you haven't seen it, published a, a, an excellent report on Monday about trade uh, and, and about the way in which they needed to secure uh, a customs union in order to continue with the work that's, that they do, which is very important, uh, the trade between the UK and, and Ireland. Um, and after speaking at the event in, uh, in Dublin, I, went, I was driven to Belfast uh, because I was uh, uh, meeting cross-community uh, leaders and then I was uh, uh, presenting an award and speaking at a, a big cross-community awards ceremony to have the Ashling uh, Awards. And then on Saturday morning, I was given a tour of the Peace Walls by uh, uh, Professor Heenan, uh, who's an expert, who's the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Ulster, and who's an expert on commu community and community issues there. And I was very struck by the sensitivity of this, this issue and how important it is. I, I was also struck, I was in Brussels last week too, I was also struck how the dialogue in Brussels about the, the, the issue of sufficient progress had changed utterly in, in two or three weeks since I was last there. Got, moved on from finance and, and issues of um, citizens' rights uh, to a focus that was almost entirely upon the border issue and how that would be resolved. Now, this will be up to negotiators and others, but it's a very difficult conundrum. Um, it is obviously utterly unacceptable to, to Ireland and to many people in the north that there should be any impediment on that border. And if you drive that border, you know precisely why that is. You know, the border has 257 crossing points. Uh, and actually, only 20 of them were open before the single market. So that you know, this has transformed uh, what's taking place. There, are, there's a wonderful statistic I can't remember exactly about the fact that you know there, there are far, far fewer. I mean, I think you know, well in the in the teens of crossing points on European frontiers from the Arctic Circle to the Urals. But there's all this number in Ireland, and it would just it would absolutely change things uh, and very damagingly where they there to be impediments and crossings. So they need to resolve this, but they resolve this in the context of the political agreement with the DUP, and you heard what happened at the DUP conference this week. Now, it is up to them to resolve it. All I can say, and I, I, I did this in an interview in Ireland on Friday morning, there are issues that arise in a border down the Irish Sea, which would, you know, they, they would have to be coped with, but there are issues that arise for Scottish ports, for Ardrossan, for Stranraer, for Cairn Ryan. Um, and they are physical issues, of course, because of capability of those ports, if you have to introduce you know, customs checks or whatever in those ports, that creates a big difficulty. I've met with the British Ports Association, Chamber of Shipping, talking about you know, physical infrastructure of ports. That would take some time to deal with. There are also security implications which would have to be dealt with as well. Um, clearly, there's an unacceptability of that in parts of Northern Ireland that would be problematic. You know, the solution to this lies in what the Scottish Government's position is now and has been for the last year, which is we should not be leaving the EU, but we should definitely not be leaving the single market and the customs union. You know, this is, this is crazy, uh, because it will create all these difficulties, and there are no advantages in, in leaving those. You know, the boasted advantages, if I may use that Burnsian phrase, you know, of, of Brexit in these regard, are absolutely un, untested. And when you look at them closely, they fall to pieces. Uh, you know, in terms of the customs union, where are these free trade agreements that are to be held with lots of other people that are going to compensate us for you know, the front page story today in terms of the, the Fraser Valander report, for the loss of the, the jobs and trading income that will come from that? So we really need to be very clear that the best solution for this is undoubtedly continuation in the customs union and the single market, certainly the customs union. And in those circumstances, if that is to take place, it should also take place for the rest of the UK. It should certainly take place for Scotland because that avoids those issues. And it also allows the trading relationships to continue. And it is not, you know, it is not simply the Scottish Government that's saying this. This is being said widely. And I go back to the British Irish Chamber of Commerce. This is you know, the position of business and industry, who are saying if you impose these new barriers because you remove yourself from the customs union, you do nobody any favours of any description. The um, French ambassador to the US, um, rather memorably about a month ago, you know, pointed out that, that you know, it isn't in the interests of free trade to remove yourself from the largest free trade bloc on the planet and 53 free trade agreements, which is precisely what is happening. So that needs to be reconsidered. Okay, thanks. Um, Patrick, I think you'd 
the Minister introduced the Fraser Valander Institute. I think you want to ask him questions about sectoral impact, so that's probably as good a place to come in, and I'll come to James. I, I did want to ask about, um, <coughs> you know, when is a, a, an impact assessment not an impact assessment? And you, you wrote uh, to the UK government yesterday uh, after having been given uh, what I think you described as uh, uh, material that is shallow and contains no policy options, still less assessment of impacts. Um, am I right in thinking that you have agreed to accept that information from the UK government on the basis of secrecy and that you will not be sharing it with this committee? You are right to accept that the material was given to us on the, um, with the understanding that we would not publish it. Um, and I think that we, in those circumstances, certainly we're not going to publish it. However, we have urged the UK government to publish it. It belongs to them. And we have supported the DEXU committee's position that it should be published. But I, I, I think you know, we, we have to be very careful about what we do, uh, what any government does when it's given material by another government, just as material we would give uh, into governmental terms. So I'm not going to publish it, but I am urging the UK government to publish it. And I am urging them to uh, publish the material that clearly isn't in this. These, these are in the form of really standard templates that have been filled in, more or less. Uh, and it's pretty thin. Some of it, I have to say, I do recognise from papers that may have come to uh, GMC when it was meeting. So I think some of it is rehash of other material. I, mean, I, I, I don't think any of us should be particularly surprised that, that you're unimpressed by the, the quantity and quality of what's there, given that the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the UK government has variously described these, these impact assessments as both existing, non-existing, uh, sketchy and uh, in excruciating detail. They can't be mm. all, all these things simultaneously. But I, I am slightly disturbed by the implication of your decision to accept this information on the basis that you will withhold it from parliamentary scrutiny and from public scrutiny. Surely you agree with the basic principle that if the Westminster parliamentary scrutiny has access to this information, so should the Holyrood parliamentary scrutiny. Uh, and surely you would not provide information to the UK government on the basis that it would keep it secret. So why, why agree to the same thing in the Well, I, I might, uh, let's just be clear about this. I might well provide a letter or information to the UK government on the basis of confidentiality. Uh, and that would be a reasonable thing to do. Uh, you know, if the, if the This month in the chamber, you said to me the Scottish government believes Patrick, in the need for transparency let, let, Patrick, on the Brexit negotiations. Please let the minister finish his question. Uh, and, his and it does please. believe in the need for transparency. You asked me I would not, if I would provide material to the UK government on the basis of secrecy. I indicated that I would provide, say, a letter or information to the UK government in the course of negotiations that was confidential. It may not be confidential forever. But it, that would be the basis of, of an exchange of letters. I, you know, I have exchanged letters with members of this committee on a confidential basis, and I'm sure I will do so again. Um, however, uh, you know, it is clear that if these, this material is provided, for example, uh, publicly to every MP, I would regard ourselves as no longer bound by any condition, and therefore I think every M MSP should have it too. We're not at that stage yet. I mean, I don't think we'll be far away from this material being in the public domain, and I'll be very comfortable about that. But I, I, I really find I have to be very careful that I am not simply receiving material or information and automatically publishing it. My, my, my inclination is to make as much everything I possibly can public. But on this occasion, this is material that's been provided to us, as it was provided to the DEXU committee, uh, in a confidential way. I think it should be public. I think it will become public. But I can't make an ex cathedra decision upon that. And it's, the parallel to that is what happens in FOI. Uh, in FOI, if you seek a document, then the person you should seek that information from is the person from whom the document originates. And we've done that you know, before as a Scottish government. And I think we have to be mindful of that. I, I would just uh, express surprise that mm. you've agreed to accept information on the basis that you will withhold it as the I, UK government. Well, is just to be absolutely clear, we're, I haven't we're agreed getting miles to away from the bill now. Can I just make it clear, Camilla? I haven't agreed to accept it. It was provided to us. I wouldn't want to think that uh, I was being misrepresented in this matter. Patrick, I think you've, you've, Patrick, you've had enough. You've had enough, Patrick. James. Yeah, th thanks, convener. Um, just interested in this uh, island, Northern Ireland aspect, Minister. Um, 
You said uh, earlier that in terms of discussions with evolved administrations, and I, I totally agree with you that it's really regrettable that there's no elected representation in relation to Northern Ireland. Clearly from your trip uh, at the weekend, you've had extensive uh, discussions and meetings uh, across there. I just wondered if you picked up any sense that there's any chance of that impasse being broken in terms of, you know, uh, seeking to ensure that there's an election and then a, 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 an elected, uh, at any sense that the, there's going to be elected uh, officials involved in this, because clearly at this time, really crucial time for Northern Ireland in terms of Brexit, uh, they're, you know, the, in terms of elected officials, they're empty from the table. Yes, and that's deeply to be regretted. I mean, this this is a matter for the Northern Irish parties, and I wouldn't want to interfere in any way, but I don't get any sense that change is imminent in that regard. I think that is problematic. You know, we're, we, we're, you know, it's axiomatic. We're at a crucial stage. We're always at a crucial stage in, in this issue. But it is, there is a lack of representation. You know, at the JMC, you know, the, rep, the presence of an official, no matter how senior, is not the same as having you know, the political parties represented. And of course, you know, at the start of this process, Northern Ireland chose to, in its membership of uh, JMC that it should be the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. So Arlene Foster and Martin McGuinness were the original representatives at the JMC. And that showed the seriousness with which this was taken. And the fact that the issue in Northern Ireland has been a difficult issue because Northern Ireland remain, voted to remain, but its principal political party voted to, to leave. And squaring that circle is something, you know, Martin McGuinness was, was very focused on. And I think that, that process has not moved on in any way. Um, and it's, uh, it's to be regretted. But we keep our dialogue going. I mean, I, I have always tried to meet all the political parties. I wasn't able to see the DUP this weekend as they were, they were in conference, but I would hope to see them at some stage. And we, like, we do try and keep a dialogue open so that con, you know, conversations can take place. Um, and, for example, the issue of the withdrawal bill you know, is one that needs some focus in Northern Ireland because it affects the Northern Ireland uh, Assembly just as much as it affects the rest of us. But it's not had that focus. And I think you know, a number of the parties regret that and have had conversations with myself and with Mark Drakeford about that issue. Okay. Because we're a bit of time, I give a bit of latitude there. And we've obviously covered areas that go beyond our primary purpose today. Um, but I think that's all the questions related to the legislative consent motion and the issue about the EU withdrawal bill completed. Thank you, Minister, for coming in front of us today. And I yep. suspend this meeting until I change over witnesses.
Okay, um, the, the second item of agenda today is to discuss the impact of Brexit on the Scottish budget, and we're joined for that item by Dr Jim Campbell, the reader in Women in Scotland's Economy Research Centre at the Glasgow Caledonia University, Jonathan Hall, Director of Policy and Member Services at NFU Scotland, and Naomi Clayton from the Policy Research Manager at the Centre for Cities. Can I thank, thank the witnesses very much for coming along today, your written submissions, um, and, I, and Adam Tompkins would like to... That's the first question. Thank you, Gamina. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to ask a question uh, really, that's really about cities, so I may be directed at Naomi in the first instance, but by all means, other witnesses ch chip in. Uh, I, I'm an MSP for the Glasgow region, so I have a particular interest in the impact of Brexit on the Glasgow economy. And um, a paper on that was published in October 2016 by the um, Glasgow City Council, the Glasgow Economic Leadership Board, and the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce. And the then leader of Glasgow City Council, um, Councillor Frank McAviti, um, said on the publication of that document the following, um, Brexit will confront Glasgow with major economic challenges, but these can be overcome, he said, if special action is taken by the Scottish and United Kingdom governments. And if that happens, the problems associated with Brexit can become an opportunity for economic growth. So my question is, what are the opportunities for economic growth for Scotland's cities, including Glasgow? Um, that Brexit represents, and how can we ensure that we take those opportunities? Right. Okay, um, so um, the work that we've done looking at the potential impacts of Brexit in terms of the change in the UK's um, trading relationships finds that every um, part of the UK and every city is uh, likely to be impacted whether um, we exit the UK under a hard or, or soft um, uh, Brexit scenario. Um, so we definitely need to be looking at ways to mit mitigate the, the impacts of, of Brexit by firstly ensuring that we secure the best trade deal for uh, the UK with the EU um, to ensure that um, our cities and businesses within them are able to continue uh, to trade um, with uh, their kind of main trading partner. Um, we also need to look at ways to support businesses through um, uh, c ensuring that they're able to access the skills uh, that they need. And there's obviously a key role there for the cities and city regions um, uh, to um, really try to understand the role that um, uh, uh, and, and the kind of skills needs of businesses and ensure that education and training providers are responding to those. So I think that um, uh, mitigating against some of the impacts in terms of uh, the impacts on uh, migration um, through uh, kind of education and, and training providers is absolutely vital um, and continuing to ensure uh, on a city level that businesses are absolutely able to to thrive um, through investment in um, infrastructure um, and and skills as, as well um, so uh, I think there are there are still opportunities um, in terms of how we ensure uh, businesses are able to trade not just with the EU but around the world um, but there are key ways in which uh, our cities can help support businesses to do that. And is it your sense that either the Scottish or the United Kingdom governments are doing enough to help cities in Scotland and in the rest of the UK um, to, to, as you put it, mitigate the effects or impacts of, of Brexit? Because Councillor McAviti was saying that, you know, that that's what he was calling for. He was calling for assistance from both levels of government in Scotland here and at the UK level. Um, uh, to assist um, Scottish cities to do exactly what you what you are saying, which is you know to boost infrastructure investment um, and uh, and to um, invest in skills training. Yeah. Um, so obviously we've had um, the two city region deals for for Glasgow and Edinburgh, um, and they represent um, fairly significant funding agreements with those um, city regions. Um, but th what they don't represent is any um, kind of real uh, devolution of powers and responsibilities or fiscal autonomy. So um, I think going forward, it's important um, that uh, the UK and Scottish governments um, uh, work with um, 
our kind of city authorities and city regions to look at what powers and responsibilities they need to be able to respond to the neat, unique challenges in there. But what's your view about what, I mean, you're the expert on this, what's your, what's your view on the powers that cities in Scotland need that they don't currently have um, uh, to mitigate the effects of Brexit? I'm glad you mentioned the Glasgow and Edinburgh city deals. The interesting thing about those two city deals, of course, mm -hmm. is that one is pre-Brexit, yep. Glasgow, and one is post-Brexit. Yep. Edinburgh. So, uh, you know, are, are, are the are, are new generation city deals, are the most recent city deals reflecting adequately, in your judgment, um, the fact that we are going to leave the European Union? I think, um, well, there's, there's always an argument um, for more investment in things like skills and education. Um, I think there's also an argument for looking at ways in which... Um, the Scottish cities can gain um, more kind of fiscal autonomy um, and uh, the ability, for instance, to gain from land value uplift in their cities. Um, so, for instance, any um, uplift in, in land values that comes about from kind of planning permissions, housing developments, um, if they're able to retain um, and, and actually capture um, more of that value, that, that would enable them to um, in further invest in um, infrastructure um, and initiatives that actually help to support um, better economic and social outcomes in those cities. Okay, thank you. Now, Neil, I think you, you had a wider issue around <coughs> Glasgow as well, so you want to just deal with that just now before... Uh, yeah, thanks, on, thanks, Camina. Good morning. Um, I'm an MSP for the West Scotland region, which, which borders um, Glasgow um, and, and a number of local authorities around around Glasgow. Um, I noticed from, from your report you talked about non-urban areas not being as badly affected as, as urban areas in terms of the Brexit impact. Uh, but obviously there's a number of local authorities that aren't in cities but but are but are you know densely urban areas as well. And, and it appears from from your map that local authorities such as Renfrewshire, Inverclyde, East Renfrewshire uh, will be as badly affected by a hard or soft Brexit as 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 Glasgow. Just wanted to ask you what you think the um, the, the impact on employment and living standards will be on 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 areas you know uh, in and around Glasgow um, and and those local authorities, uh, and also in terms of just following up the point of mitigating the effects of of, of Brexit. Um, would I be right in saying that the, the same policy solutions that you're talking about in terms of making a difference in Glasgow would also affect the the neighbouring local authorities, you like to your emphasis, your emphasis and the Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, those areas obviously form impar important parts of the kind of wider um, city region. Um, and uh, whilst we find that um, the kind of uh, the cities and um, kind of uh, kind of primary urban areas within Scotland are likely to be hit hardest, actually everywhere every local authority um, is predicted to see a loss in economic output as a result of, of Brexit relative to if we'd stayed in the EU. Um, so um, uh, uh, that means um, that we may, may well see a loss of jobs and um, uh, wages continuing to stagnate. So that will obviously impact on um, living standards. Um, so... Um, the, the impacts aren't just confined to cities, um, but of course we need to look at ways in which um, we can support those cities to continue to drive um, economic growth um, through the, the kind of various policy initiatives that um, I referred to, um, but also looking at, at ways in which... Um, uh, the Scottish Government and cities can, can continue to support inclusive growth um, and that uh, people in um, the kind of wider um, areas surrounding our, our kind of main um, economic um, growth poles are able to access the, the, the employment opportunities in those, those areas. Before we move on to other questions, I'm going to bring you all in, in this area. But that doesn't prohibit either of the other two witnesses contributing at this stage because I noticed uh, Dr Jim Campbell, for instance, in your own paper, you talk about areas that where the Scottish Government would need to concentrate 
um, some of their activity and spending. For instance, you say in, um, on the second page, um, under bullet point three, that in, as far as Scottish small to medium-sized enterprises are concerned, that the Scottish Government should be looking at ways to in which their spending can contribute to faster growth in the short term and medium term. That would obviously be the same truth. The same truth would exist for cities, and therefore maybe you'd like to expand on how you envisage that might help help activity in the cities. Because at the moment, a lot of the concentration is going directly to Naomi, and I want the rest of you, frankly, to take up some of the burden here. I, mean, I think the point I was uh, uh, trying to make there was that we don't really know what. Brexit will look like, uh, whether it's a hard Brexit, soft Brexit or something in between. Uh, but clearly, trading relations between ourselves and the EU will be different from what they are just now. Uh, there will be barriers, uh, and there's no doubt about that. And I think that is much more of an issue for small and medium-sized firms to deal with. And that's what I was trying to get at, that the Scottish Government maybe needs to provide support for companies who are already exporting to, to mainland Europe so that they can continue to do so after Brexit. Have you any views on what that support might look like? Because it would help us in terms of formulating our response to... Well, at, at a very practical level, it's about filling in the forms, mm. you know, because presumably we will have border controls. You know, goods will be checked as they, they enter and leave the country uh, after Brexit. Okay. Jonathan, before we move on to others, do you want to just... I'd, I'd like to make a comment. Um, first of all, I think there's a, a striking parallel between uh, the question that Mr. Tompkins posed and, and Naomi's uh, response in terms of the major economic challenges from Brexit. And but then again, there are there are also significant opportunities or um, potential for economic growth, and that applies equally uh, to cities and rural areas, uh, and particularly the rural areas driven by an agricultural industry that then underpins the food and drink sector which is so vitally important to the, to the wider Scottish economy. So I think there are huge parallels there. And I was, I was really struck by Naomi's comments about trade and labour and migration issues being very much to the fore of their thinking because they're very much to the fore of our thinking. Uh, the, the added dimension, of course, from an agriculture and rural development point of view is the role that uh, current European support plays, and I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to that. Um, but I think, you know, from our, from our perspective, I, I don't see a, a real difference and I was intrigued by the comment non-urban areas uh, does that mean rural uh, I'm not sure uh, you know define I, I'm, I'm sure I, I know you're all these definitions and they're very academic but they're also very interesting I guess um, but I, I don't I, I think it's uh, there's a danger that we fall in the trap about looking at w issues that are particularly for cities or particularly for SMEs in a, in a more sort of uh, industrial base and then looking separately at agriculture and rural rural issues as well. I think we need to bring these things together a bit. Well, yeah, so oh, I know so that. Don't worry. We're, we'll make sure you, you get a chance to say your particular bits about your area, because a, a number of us around the table here represent rural constituencies in the widest sense of the word. Ivan. Uh, thanks, convener, and thanks, uh, panel, for coming along to talk to us this morning. I just wanted to kind of lift up to an overview, um, and it's really fallen up from the question that Adam Tompkins asked about opportunities. Um, and I think the answer was very illuminating, as Mr Hall said, that, 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 that Naomi gave. Um, from, from where I'm sitting and looking at the papers you've submitted and all the data that's in there, we see a, a GVA impact, which ranges from bad in the case of soft Brexit to very bad in the case of a hard Brexit. We see a public sector finance impact. We see a EU funding impact. There's a whole bunch of negative impacts there. Um, and all the con all the, the, the narrative is round about how we mitigate, not how we maximise. So there, the way I'm looking at it is there is no upside, and it, it's kind of been described as the, the first time in history that two sides have sat down to do a trade deal that's going to make both of them worse off. Um, so I don't know if you want to kind of comment on it. Do you see any silver linings, or based on all the economic analysis that there is everything ranging from worse to a lot worse? Right. Do you want to see that one on? Yes, I think you're right. Uh, it's the economy would be better if we didn't leave. I think there's a pretty much a consensus around that amongst most most economists. The, the disagreement was how worse off we'll be, uh, you know, whether we're really badly worse off or, uh, you know, not significantly worse off. So that's, you know, that's 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 up for debate and you know it's forecast. So you know we all know they need to be taken with a bit of a pinch of salt. 
if you're looking for any sort of silver lining in it, uh, I think there's, there's maybe one area uh, which would be around public procurement, uh, because at the moment that, that's heavily regulated by, by European directives. You know, so when you know the Scottish government wants to give out the contract for you know for the, the island ferries, they have to go through a whole procedure, uh, which involves inviting you know tenders from throughout Europe. But we only get one tender, which is from Calmac. So it, there's not an awful lot of time and money spent on something which is not really perhaps necessary. So I think that might be something which you know the government takes more into control. They can use public procurement perhaps to support some of the the problems which would result from from Brexit. Uh, as, as a mitigating thing, so you know, I think that that to me would be one one upside from it. Could I could I just echo with that and and support that in the sense that public procurement has a huge impact on sourcing of food and food products, uh, and it's something that we've pushed hard on for a number of years. And there would be an opportunity here to actually relook at that and and look at how local authorities, schools, hospitals, prison service, and all the rest of it are enabled to source local food, which would obviously uh, be a boost to, to local producers uh, from Scotland, um, rather than it all being on price and contracts and all the rest of it. So that, that would be an opportunity. Um, but e equally, you know, I, I think there are there is a bit of a silver lining. Uh, there are huge challenges, don't get me wrong, and, and we're very concerned about those, as we'll, I'm sure we'll come on to, but some of the silver lining in terms of how the, the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, has operated within Scotland, how in many ways, uh, whilst it might have provided a degree of security and certainty for the last 43 years, it hasn't necessarily done Scottish agriculture and rural areas any great favours either, if we're being brutally honest. So there is a, a clear opportunity right now to recast how we support rural areas and support agricultural businesses to deliver more of what we actually want in terms of quality food production, protection of the environment, sustaining rural communities and so on. So there, I think there is an opportunity here. That will revolve around funding, which I'm sure we'll come on to, but equally then about how the Scottish Government delivers on that. I was wanting to ask a specific question that day, so we will, we will get there. I, I, I'm just being impatient, I appreciate it. No, 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 <laughs> we're all impatient in this Brexit world, I can assure you. I think chance to look at um, uh, the funds that replace uh, uh, the European structural funds, which obviously um, provide um, you know, important um, funds to um, different parts of, of the country. I think there's a chance to, to look at how we uh, improve the way that those any kind of replacement funds are managed and distributed in a way that kind of reduces bureaucracy for um, local partners and improves um, outcomes as well. So. Like comment I would, I would maybe make on the, the procurement side of things is surely it, that's fine until the point where we go and do a free trade deal with a, another country because the first thing they're going to say is if you want to trade with us we're going to have to have some rules around about access to markets which means we're back to square one again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean it's, it's all in the detail really yeah. which okay. we don't know. Thanks. Alexander? Put you back on the spot, back the uh, report. I, as the MSP for Aberdeenshire West, it'd be remiss of me not to ask you about uh, your findings of Aberdeen not being such an outlier, um, and really around three reasons. I mean, probably in the northeast, we consider ourselves linked economically less to the EU and even the UK uh, economic performance, but more to the oil sector. Um, secondly, when you mentioned the uh, city deals that Scotland had, you missed out the mentioning the Aberdeen uh, one, and, and thirdly. Uh, in your summary of findings, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, uh, those cities most negatively affected tend to be more productive and hi highly skilled workforces, which means they may find it easier to adapt in the longer term. Just with those three reasons, maybe would you uh, maybe like to talk about how accurate you think your methodology is regarding Aberdeen? Well, I think it um, very much uh, represents a first look at the potential uh, local impacts in terms of um, uh, a change in the UK's international trade relationships. Um, and there are a number of caveats. Um, the first being that we are looking um, uh, just at the impacts of trade we're not factoring in um, the impacts in, in terms of changes to migration, the impact on foreign direct investment. Um, and once you start to, 
to um, add in those um, factors, uh, we find that at the national level, the impacts are likely to, um, in some cases, triple. Um, um, so that would be the, the first thing. The other um, point is that um, this is a static analysis. We, we, we haven't, um, at the moment, been able to model how um, different areas are likely um, to respond to the shocks, um, the economic shocks that um, Brexit is likely to um, bring. So uh, we know, for instance, from um, the experience with the 2008 financial crisis, um, uh, parts of the country um, that had... Uh, higher wages, that were more productive and had a more highly skilled workforce, we found that actually over the, the slightly longer term, they were better placed to adapt um, and recovered um, much more strongly coming out of um, the recession. Um, so uh, in some ways we would expect that um, uh, to happen again and for cities like Aberdeen and, and Edinburgh, um, because um, they have um, very high, highly skilled workforces. They have very uh, productive economies. In some ways, that makes them better placed to adapt to the changes going forward. Um, but I suppose a, a particular challenge for, for Aberdeen is uh, the dependency on oil and gas and the potential impacts of Brexit on that sector. Thank you very much. Patrick? Thank you. Um, I, was, I was going to pick up on... on uh, something that uh, Neil McClayton just, just raised and possibly draw a connection or ask if there's a connection with something in uh, Jim Campbell's paper. Um, page 12 of the Centre for Cities um, report talks about this, this argument. Even though the immediate negative impacts are predicted to be smaller in poorer regions, households in those areas start off poorer and may experience considerably more difficulty in adapting to those negative changes. And in in Jim Campbell's paper, you, you talk about the role of the care sector, uh, social care, um, child care, and the, the evidence that we've heard from others as well that there's a, there's a multiplier effect, that there's an ad additional economic benefit from investing in that social infrastructure. Would it be fair to say that it's, in, that it's likely to be in those poorer areas where uh, dependence on the care sector is perhaps higher, that those multiplier effects will be stronger uh, and that investment in, in social infrastructure could be one of the things that mitigates or, or might have some potential to mitigate that, that effect uh, that, um, that the Centre for Cities paper was talking about of, of poorer regions or, or households that start off poorer being less able to adapt. I, I mean, I think this represents a kind of a long-term challenge um, uh, in the um, UK in terms of um, the levels of disparity between um, uh, parts of, of the country and the fact that, um, you know, our research finds that, as I've said, uh, everywhere is likely to be impacted by Brexit. Um, and whilst the initial shocks may be um, smaller in less affluent parts of, of the country. We also know that unemployment rates tend to be much higher, that wages tend to be much lower. So um, the, the, uh, those initial uh, shocks might actually have um, longer term um, impacts for those economies and that they're, they're le less likely to be able to adapt um, in the same way um, some of the uh, stronger performing parts of the country um, will be. Um, and uh, I think absolutely investing in the social infrastructure um, in terms of investing in education investing in um, ways to improve school performance, investing in things um, uh, like um, retraining schemes um, and um, the other uh, ways of supporting um, individuals in those communities to access employment opportunities and to progress um, is an absolutely fundamental, fun fundamentally important part of helping um, those places um, adapt to the changes that are likely to be brought by Brexit. I, mean, I, I would say that if what you're looking to do is to generate employment, then investing in the social economy will give you more employment 
and say investing in construction. And all the evidence would, would, would tell you that. The one caveat to that, of course, is that uh, employment in the care sector is low paid, uh, you know, both in childcare and in, in social care in general. So I think there also needs to be a, a move which professionalises the care sector. And, you know, whether that's through through uh, education and, and qualification, etc., but that the wages need to come up because it's a very important thing, childcare and also social care. And, and uh, our market economy doesn't value it as, as, as much as we should. It needs to be in raising quality, not just Absolutely. scale. Yeah, I mean, I mean, ever, all the studies about the, the, the social and economic benefits of childcare are on a caveat that it's quality childcare and it's not just sticking a kid in front of a video and for a couple of hours and that's them looked after. It has to be you know, something which is stimulating and also, to some, in some senses, educational as well. Thank you. Ash. Yeah, to be the trend this morning to, for everybody to say where they represent, so I'll stick to that as well. So I'm an Edinburgh MSP, so I'm going to ask a question about Edinburgh. So, um, Naomi, in your written submission, you said that cities with um, large shares of employment in private sector knowledge intensive services were likely to be particularly impacted by Brexit, and obviously that would describe Edinburgh because Edinburgh's got a large financial services sector. So I guess if we're looking at impacts, that potentially would reduce employment. So I think you said that in your submission. So it's the first, for the first time Scotland's going to be taking over you know, income tax. And obviously if there's reduction in employment, and particularly in well-paid jobs, um, of which there are quite a lot in Edinburgh, that would then in turn affect the Scottish tax take, which would affect public services going forward. I mean, is that what the Scottish Government should be preparing for? And are you able to, to put any numbers on that or what, what scale of the impact would be? Um, I would come back to the points um, that were made earlier about um, the, uh, the caveats that we, we've highlighted in, in, in the paper um, in terms of this really does represent a first look at the potential impacts of Brexit under um, different scenarios. Um, um, and it is based on on very kind of detailed uh, models of, of, of trade flows and impacts on different sectors. And of course, we do find that um, the financial and business services are likely to be particularly hard hit under that ha hard Brexit um, uh, scenario because of um, particularly the non the increase in non tr uh, tariff um, barriers and the impact that that will have on on those sectors. Um, um, so, uh, if those uh, impacts do play out in terms of um, loss of uh, employment and earnings, that will, of course, then impact on um, tax take. Um, uh, and uh, I suppose it's particularly significant given that levels of tax take on a per capita basis are are amongst the highest in, in Edinburgh and Aberdeen. Um, so that may well have an impact on um, the Scottish finances overall. Um, but at this point, because there are so, so many uncertainties in terms of um, uh, the kind of nature of the deal that will be agreed with the EU um, and um, the kind of uh, what um, the kind of uh, the reality will be post Brexit, and in terms of um, the elements that we haven't been able to model as yet, in terms of how places are likely to adapt, it's difficult to to put any firm numbers on um, the kind of uh, overall economic impacts and therefore um, impacts on um, tax take. Yeah, that's what I pick up on that one. Just uh, one additional point, I think you're right, that the, the, the biggest impact is going to be over time. Uh, you know, if you look at our, uh, you know, our impact of membership of the EU, the biggest impact wasn't when we joined. It's as businesses changed the way in which they behaved because of the change in their environment. They had access to, to a much bigger market, encouraged investment, etc., etc. So you would expect that if we leave, that's another massive change to the business environment. So businesses will react. Uh, and the financial sector, they might back by leaving, you know, because they're, they're not, they don't have the same access to the, to, to the European market that they, that they currently have. Okay, Murdo. Thank you. I've, I've got a, a couple of quick questions on cities, and I want to get on to agriculture, if that's okay. Um, maybe, um, Naomi Clayton, just looking at your report, I was, I was just curious as to why you only have four Scottish cities in the, in the analysis. There actually are seven, as I'm sure you know. Uh, yes, so... 
Um, we, uh, we look at the 63 largest urban areas um, at the centre for cities, so that includes the four largest urban areas within Scotland, which is why we just look at four. Linked to Inverness, Stirling or Perth, but they're not included. No, um, but we do. We have um, produced um, figures for every local authority throughout the UK, yeah. which includes um, those Scottish authorities. Okay, and, and my second point is, and there's a follow-up to the questions Alexander Burnett was asking about Aberdeen, because I was quite surprised to see Aberdeen as, as top of the table as the one city most likely to be impacted, when uh, I think most people's understanding of the Aberdeen economy is because of the connection to oil and gas, the, the connection is more with dollar economies and oil producing countries across the world and that impacts much more on Aberdeen's economic performance than does the Eurozone where comparatively speaking trade is much less <laughs> and yet you have Aberdeen as most impacted and I'm wondering is this just because you've looked at this question of shares of employment in private sector knowledge intensive services as a generality rather than sort of dig, dug below that headline to try and look at local economies? So, um, so what we've done in terms of the methodology is that we've, we've taken um, the national model that looks at um, um, essentially all of the kind of the imports and exports for all of the different industries within in the UK. Um, and then we've applied that uh, model down using employment shares um, for uh, local authorities and cities. Um, so Aberdeen stands out as as uh, the city where um, the initial um, impacts of, of Brexit are likely to be um, largest, partly because of uh, the oil and gas industry and because of employment in the business services that support that, that industry too. Um, and this model predicts that oil and gas and uh, business service sectors are likely to be hardest hit, um, which is why Aberdeen stands out as, as being um, one of the hardest hit areas. Okay, thank you. I, I, th I think I take from that, though, is, is a generalist model you've applied rather than look specifically at the makeup in individual cities. We've, we've looked at the makeup of, of individual cities in terms of their employment profile. Right, okay, okay, thank you. Um, maybe I could move on to, to Jonathan Hall and uh, get on to agriculture, because I, I was very interested in what you had to say about um, the common agricultural policy and its impact on Scotland, and in particular what you had to say about the opportunity that presents itself to devise a system of agricultural support for Scotland going forward that uh, uh, is more tailored to the needs of Scottish agriculture rather than being handed down from, uh, from Brussels. Um, as it currently stands, we are due to leave the EU in 16 months from now. What is your sense of the work that's being done in government currently to devise that new system of agricultural support that will need to be in place when we leave the EU? Um, I'll have to choose my words very carefully. Um, sluggish might be appropriate. Um, if we're honest, though, if, if we look at 2019 as being where you see the point of departure, I, I think we would say that actually the point of departure needs to be further uh, ahead than that. Say 2021, we will need some sort of transition the day of departure. We really do need to continue to operate under what would look, taste and smell uh, very much like the CAP today. Um, we cannot afford to go off any sort of cliff edge. People talk about cliff edges all the time here. Um, but Scottish agriculture and the food and drinks industry are underpins. If we went over that cliff edge uh, in March 2019, um, then I think we really are in a difficult position. Why? Because uh, there are still some hugely outstanding questions re uh, revolving around what sort of operating environment we will find ourselves in in terms of trade deals with Europe, with non-European countries and so on, and how long they will take to emerge uh, and be uh, solidify, if you like, uh, could be anybody's guess. So we will continue to need, I think, in the short to medium term, the CAP as we like it, loathe it, or whatever. Um, having said that, we must then take the opportunity to work through 
the period from now to 2019 and any transition period to work very, very hard with the UK government and with the Scottish government to secure the right uh, framework for uh, an agricultural policy across the United Kingdom, which will cover the regulatory elements of that because there are clearly uh, is a need to maintain a, something of a level playing field within the UK if we're going to have intra-UK trade and movement of animals, pesticide use, environmental standards and so on. But thereafter, it's about uh, devolving um, the ability to deliver a, a new system of support that is tailored for Scotland's circumstances to the Scottish Government. Now, I think there's one or two clear, important landmarks or milestones on the very near horizon. Uh, there will be a white paper on agriculture from the UK government emerging in the very near future. Um, and there will be an agriculture bill sometime in the spring at a UK level. Now, our main focus right now, as we talk to DEFRA down south, is to ensure that there is the, uh, or there are the tools in the toolbox Within that, there is the scope within that to enable Scottish agriculture to put in place the measures uh, that will be required to support agriculture and rural development in Scotland. Just as we have today under the Common Agricultural Policy, we have four devolved applications of that, four very different delivery mechanisms. We need to ensure that that continues in the future. And really, we also then therefore need the funding uh, to, to underpin that as well. Um, any significant reduction in funding, uh, I think, would be catastrophic as well as, as well as being able to do the right thing for Scotland. You need the funding to then deliver that. OK, thank you. So if I, if I can summarise what, what I think you said to me, that, that, that there will be, you're expecting a transition period. So, you know, come 2019, we won't have a new system there. We'll, we'll, we'll mirror the CAP support, whether we're in that or not, for a period of perhaps, what, two years, maybe, so something like that. I'm sorry, I'm putting words in your mouth. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just surmising. Uh, but thereafter, we'll need to move to a new system. There'll be some degree of common framework with the UK, but most of this actually is devolved to Scottish government. And what I'm trying to get at is, could, are you able to tell us what work is the Scottish government currently doing that you're aware of to create this new system of agricultural support that we need to have in place and which your members want to see? Um, I, again, I don't think there's anything really concrete being constructed either at Westminster or within Scottish Government on what this might or might not look like. There's a lot of rhetoric around this in terms of where we might want to get to, but in terms of putting in the steps that will take us there, I think we're still lacking. Uh, we uh, have set out our position very clearly that we want to move away ultimately from essentially an area-based system in Scotland whereby the occupation of land is... is, is pretty much all you need to do to unlock a support payment, more to being uh, an activity-based approach whereby actions are what are supported, whether that's action to uh, you know, enhance environmental qualities or indeed invest in, in agricultural businesses that can focus on new market opportunities. So that, that's where we want to be. But we are pushing both Scottish Government and the UK Government hard to say, well, how this might be the vision that everybody keeps talking about, but how are we actually going to get there? Right, okay, but, but at the moment, not much is happening. But your your members, NFUS, you have got your own ideas that you're bringing forward Absolutely. as well. Yeah, you want to and see. I, 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 just, I, I think there's, a, there's an increasing sense of frustration across the industry. Uh, you know, whilst Scottish Government have recently produced a report from its so called agricultural champions, and we've been quick to highlight what we like, and I think there's a lot of common overlap there. So there's lots of uh, thought and ideas to the sort of where we want to get to but we still really need to work very hard at the mechanics of moving away from the common agricultural policy uh, and how we then deliver what we're all aspiring to, to to achieve now that is where it gets really really difficult because you've got to then take into account things like well the fact that you still want to trade with europe and so on and and obviously the requirements of other other legislative issues and so on so it becomes a very very tricky road to, to walk but uh, we need to start making some steps in that direction pretty quickly okay, okay then what comes first the agricultural bill and the framework or a policy um that's a very good question well, of course it is i i i because <laughs> <laughs> we need to get some the, we need to get some priorities here about what has to be tackled first the priorities for me are that the agriculture bill 
setting out the broad framework should come first. But within that bill, there has to be the scope that would then enable Scotland to do what is right for Scotland. Now, that, that I think, is the danger at the moment. If it's too narrow, if the, and I'll, I'll be slightly uh, cheeky here, if the, if, the, if, the, if the view of the world is everything looks like Cambridgeshire, then it's not going to do us any great favours. Uh, we need the scope within that to, to enable the Scottish Government to put in place measures which will work for Scottish agriculture and everything that it underpins. So while it's sluggish, uh, the description you used in terms of what's the policy development, it's a bit difficult for a government to be involved in developing policy until it actually knows where the starting point is. I would agree. I would agree. Um, I, you know, I, I think there are definitely uh, things that we can start to think about, we can start to plan for, but it is difficult. If, if you don't know the parameters in which you have to work, it, it is difficult. Um, but nevertheless, I think the focus has to be on DEFRA at the moment to, to ensure that the, the parameters are set in such a way that Scotland can be accommodated within that UK approach. Uh, and that then the delivery of that is absolutely within the gift of Scottish Government. Yeah, and, and obviously you, you can have a great policy, but unless you've got money to support it, it's going to be even more challenging. And in paragraph seven of your paper, you said post-2022, because you had some assurances to 19. The amount of money the UK decides to spend on farming and farming-related matters will have major consequences for Scotland. The NFUS is clear that agriculture must continue to receive the same quantum of funding as it currently does under CAP post-2022. The budget must be ring-fenced to agriculture and rural support. What assurance have you had from the UK government? We've had only the assurance of the Tory party manifesto of May and June of this year. Uh, we have sought further assurances to what that commitment to f uh, future funding of farm support to 2022 or the lifetime of the Parliament actually means. We have written to Mr Gove, as I believe Scottish Government have as well, and we haven't received a reply yet, and that we've written some months ago now. Um, so we, we do need clarification on what that commitment actually means. I would go further than our submission and say we, we need a, at least the same quantum of money as we receive now under the CAP. Um, given the fact that, that Scotland already has a budget disadvantage in terms of the amount of money coming to uh, Scotland via the CAP compared to arguably the rest of the UK and other member states. Um, and yet Scotland's reliance on that funding is critical. But I think the more important point to really note is how effective that money is once it comes to Scotland in, in the sense that once it's channeled into Scottish agriculture into farms and crofts that that then generates and drives a rural economy uh, to an extent that is very difficult to quantify but our calculations would suggest that for every pound that Scottish agriculture receives via the CAP Scottish agriculture is then spending about five pounds thirty um, and that is supporting a whole host of allied industries and so on and it's also then enabling the, the, the primary product that's going into the fastest growing part of the economy, namely food and drink. Sorry, forgive me, just one final question in this area, because the, our, the purpose of this is Brexit and the budget, effectively, is what we're trying to get to. And you mentioned in paragraph 10 of your paper about the potential different funding streams that might be used to support agriculture in Scotland in the future. And if it was to go via the, if, if funding in the future was to go through the Barnett formula, you lay, lay out some concerns. Would you like to tell us about these concerns? Yeah, but, well, very simply, under the, under the, the current uh, CAP arrangements, Scotland receives about 16.3% of the UK's allocation, and that's based on historic production uh, across the United Kingdom. Um, if, if we were to move to a, a simple barnetised approach, then potentially, look, instead of 16.3% of any budget the Treasury might find in the future, you're looking at 8 or 9% of a budget uh, that the Treasury might find. That would immediately put us in, in a difficult position. So even if the budget was maintained in total so that Treasury committed to the same funding as the CAP, if Scotland were only to receive 8 or 9% of that rather than 16%, well, that's effectively a 50% a, a reduction. Uh, that would be extraordinarily challenging for uh, Scottish agriculture as a whole but particularly, I think, for areas and regions which are more reliant on support, i.e. our uplands and our more disadvantaged areas, which are heavily reliant on, on basically sheep and, 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 and cattle, 
Um, and those businesses are the most reliant on support payments through the CAP. Uh, so the, the sort of socioeconomic consequences of knocking that out of the system could be uh, unquantifiable, but nevertheless extremely damaging. Yeah, I've got a couple of supplementaries. Emma? Yeah, um, you mentioned like the different areas about less favoured areas. 85% of our land in Scotland is uh, less favoured areas. I'm just reading here, there's 52,000 farm holdings in Scotland. I mean, this is... It's, it's, it's massive what we're talking about if we've got £520 million currently and that might reduce to £253 million. So, um, and Scott Walker expressed desperate need for progress. So rather than it being sluggish, he says we need to make de like, progress, right? So, so 485 days to go. So, you know, I'm really concerned um, and I'm not sure how to, I guess... How do we then express these concerns to the rural uh, farming businesses and then convey that to the UK government? Um, well, obviously, that's partly our job, partly your job. Um, it's everybody's job, in a way, to actually highlight how, just how important it is that we get this right. Um, places like Dumfries and Galloway, your, your area, uh, highly reliant on a, on a productive agricultural industry, uh, in so many ways. Um, but if you, as you rightly say, if you strip out that funding, then the damage could be untold. Um, and I think we've all got to make that case. Scotland is fundamentally different from the rest of the United Kingdom when it comes to its agricultural profile. You've highlighted the fact that we're 85% less favoured area in Scotland. Well, it's the mirror image in England. It's 15% is less favoured area in England. Uh, we will always be at the margin in many ways in terms of agricultural production and uh, financial viability and therefore that support remains critical but it's not about just underpinning farmers and crofters it is about underpinning everything that farmers and crofters then deliver and i think that's the key message that we've got to get through to treasury in particular that actually investing in in agriculture and rural areas is is money well spent in the public interest because it is about a return on those pounds for what agriculture then does okay Mando. Thank you. Um, can I just clarify something you said in response to a question from Bruce Crawford about, about money? You talked about ring fencing, yeah. the agricultural support. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? Do you mean ring fencing it within the devolution settlement? Um, ideally, that's what, exactly what we would like, because right now, um, right now, under the CAP, uh, the CAP money is uh, allocated to the United Kingdom by Europe. Uh, the Euro the uh, UK government can't touch that. The Scottish government can't touch that. It has to be channeled into agricultural support payments in if, if it's a pillar one payment. If it's a pillar two payment, it, it, that funding is, from Europe is, is then co-financed by the Scottish government. Um, so effectively, uh, it, it has to be, if it's coming into Scotland, it has to be channeled in the, into, into agriculture or wider rural development measures. And we would want to see some sort of ring fence put around a budget which continues to protect that rather than eroding it from within. So there might be a no notional nominal allocation for rural development spend or whatever it might be, but by the time it percolates down to, to, uh, to, to actual spend on the ground, then it's, it, it could go in any direction. Dr Campbell, you, you mentioned in your paper the issues around CAP, but you, and rightly tie it to the EU structural funds. You then go on to talk about um, and your, the last page of your document. However, one of the most important impacts at EU structural funds has been the promotion of gender mainstreaming. And then you look at the issue of leadership within the EU and the dangers that might come from that. For the record, would you like to expand on that, please, for us? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things which uh, European regional policy tried to do was to support other actions, and one action was about... Uh, equal opportunities, in particular gender mainstream. And so if you received ERDF funding or European social funding, uh, you had to show how the project was going to contribute to, to, to gender mainstream and was going to contribute to, to equal opportunities. Now, in a, a lot of the time, some of that was kind of like a tick box exercise. So, you, you know, you, you say, yeah, of course it is. And, you know, you went on. But uh, there is some evidence to suggest that it, it might have had an impact on the, the type of economic development policies uh, which have been pursued in Scotland. And, you know, without that requirement, you know, 
you know, when, pe when people, uh, you know, invest in, in projects, we assume uh, that, you know, that the, the economic uh, activity is going to be equally shared, you know, between men and women. Uh, but that's not necessarily going to be the case. Uh, so you need to actually think about what is what's the gender impact of this spend. Uh, and I think, I'm not saying it's, that happens all the time, but it did get uh, the projects and funders to think about the, the gender consequences of, of economic policy, which we hadn't really done before. So what procedural and legal framework do you think we need to put in place to help achieve that? I think a, a sort of continuation. I think one, one of the problems with uh, with uh, gender mainstreaming is, is, is sort of like in the name. Uh, the, the requirement really happened during the 2000 to 2006 period uh, of European regional funding. Thereafter, they, they kind of assumed that gender mainstreaming was happening so that you know projects would automatically think about the gender consequences. I'm not sure that that, that carried on. So there may well be an opportunity now for, for economic development policies that that's, that's put in place. Uh, we mentioned earlier about public procurement. You know, you could also use that in public procurement policy to say, well, what are the gender impact of of, of the spend? Okay, helpful. Willie, you wanted to touch on things to do with technology, I think. Hi, thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, I was hoping to just kind of broaden the discussion to talk about uh, digital and technology issues. Uh, Jim, you mentioned in your paper that there are potential impacts on research and technological development and Naomi you touched on the issue that Ash raised about the knowledge economy and knowledge based services particularly in the cities what kind of impact do you think that could have in the Scottish economy if there's a, a serious impact on free movement of people with those particular skills working in the UK or indeed in Scotland I think it could have quite a, quite a serious impact particularly in the sort of university sector I mean a lot of uh, one of the areas where I think the UK has done really well is in the various research and development frameworks from Europe, currently Horizon 2020. So universities getting funding and working with, with colleagues in other European countries. I know my own institution has actually received a number of research contracts in, in that way. And that avenue is now going to be cut off. Whether that's then replaced by a kind of a Scottish version or a UK version, we don't know because you know, the CEP is going to be a problem there, the structural funds. So there's going to be lots of com competition for for what will become very limited resources, given the you know sort of latest economic forecasts about about where the economy is going. Uh, and also, I think in the, you mentioned about the digital economy as well. I think there's, there's a lot of uh, interest in developments taking place at a European level in terms of, of regulation uh, to try and open up the digital market. Uh, you know, at the moment, there's a lot of businesses will use what's called geo-blocking. You know, if you're trying to book, uh, you know, a hotel or uh, an airline ticket in another EU country, you, you know, the price will be different depending from where you're booking, uh, you know, that, that that service from. There's currently, I think, discussion now about actually removing geo-blocking so that, you know, the, the prices need to be the same irrespective of, of where, where you're buying the service. So you get a single market, if you like, and in, in, in buying things online, which at the moment we don't really have, and I think... You know that, you know, British consumers, British business, I think, would, would, would lose out uh, as a result of that once, once we leave. It's a really interesting point. That. I mean, on the one hand, we're coming out of the single market, but on the other hand, we're staying in the digital one, you know, to take the oh, advantages yeah. of the <laughs> Because, you know, it's, it's like being in and out at the same time. Yeah, sense, but, you know, but we, can, we can't turn back the technology and say, well, let's, you know, let's not in invent yeah. the internet. Yeah. Naomi, your, your point about knowledge services, particularly city skills and so on, and what's the likely impact if we lose under freedom of movement, if we lose lots of those skills in Scotland? Well, I think um, the kind of migration element is a very important um, consideration. Um, and of course, we don't know what migration policy is going to look like post-Brexit um, as yet. But um, we do know um, through... Uh, as a result of the impact on, of, of policy change and the economic impact that the flow of migrants into um, the UK is likely to reduce. Um, so, of course, there, there will be implications in that in terms of businesses' access to the specialist skills that they, they require. Um, so I think um, it's an absolutely um, fundamental, uh, fundamentally important um, consideration um, particularly at a time when um, you know a lot of investment is also going into supporting the digital and, and tech sectors um, 
in the UK and in, in Scotland um, and uh, thinking about how um, we maximise um, the impacts of that investment um, by supporting um, the kind of wider economic and social infrastructure is really important and, and migration and the ability of businesses to kind of continue to attract and retain um, international talent is an important part of, of that. Um, and we're already starting to see some of the, the impacts um, uh, in terms of migration playing out. Um, so um, there's been a significant reduction uh, over the last year in uh, the number of national insurance registrations from um, EU citizens in the in the UK. It's very difficult to attribute that specifically to the referendum and, and Brexit because there are a number of, of factors that play into it. Um, but it does mark a trend change rather than just normal fluctuations. See, see your soft Brexit model in your paper, does that assume that freedom of movement has gone? And is that accountable for the biggest impact in those negative figures under the soft Brexit model? Is it freedom of movement gone? So we're looking primarily at, uh, we're looking primarily at the trade impacts. So under soft Brexit, um, uh, it would be a scenario where the UK joins a free trade area. Um, so we're looking at the impacts in terms of obviously um, kind of uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers rather than freedom of movement within that. So if, if the freedom of movement does go under a soft Brexit, that would make even your soft Brexit uh, forecasts even worse, I presume? Yeah, but if, you, if you start to factor in um, migration into the model. Okay, thank you for that. Jonathan, I'm not sure if you want to touch on, because we didn't get much chance to talk about migration issues for the agricultural industry, so we're, 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 we'll come to you in a minute, James, but now we're on that subject, we'll just take the chance if you want to say anything. Very, very quickly, just to, to echo what others have said, that uh, you know, it's clearly the, the, the movement of people, migration issues are hugely important to the agricultural industry, uh, but also downstream as well in terms of our food processing sector. Uh, we're very concerned about uh, seasonal workers, permanent workers, on-farm, off-farm, and the skilled and the competent. Uh, without these folk coming to Scotland to underpin um, f f agricultural production and the processing thereof, you know, we really are in a bad place. So we think there's some low-hanging fruit for the, for the UK government on this in terms of certainly seasonal workers that we could reinvigorate or reignite the, what was the seasonal agricultural workers scheme uh, that did exist a few years ago when Bulgaria and Romania were not full member states. Uh, we could certainly reinstigate that because we're all, already starting to see impacts in some sectors, particularly veg producers, soft fruit producers up and down the east coast of Scotland, already struggling to uh, to access labour both the, the, in the season just gone but for next year as well. Some of that's down to exchange rates and, and the value of actually coming here to work on a seasonal basis. But we also know that... Um, that there, there is less inclination simply because of the, the sort of messages that uh, the EU referendum outcome has, has, has delivered to some people. Just, I, I just want to follow that through a bit, if you don't make I, 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 don't, I genuinely don't know the NFUS position on it. As far as the customs union is concerned, and these, given the issues around trade for export of quality Scots beef and lamb, etc., uh, and freedom of movement of people, could you describe what sort of, if we're going to Brexit, what sort of Brexit the NFU would like to see in that regard? Well, I think we're, we're, we're probably uh, s slightly uh, over um, being over ambitious, but we would still argue for access to the single market and with the uh, retention of the customs union to provide that level of protection. You're absolutely right in terms of identifying particularly our red meat, our sheep meat and our beef products would be massively exposed if we're not uh, covered by the, the customs union. Um, and that they are the sectors that are, are, are extremely vulnerable for, from any sort of uh, new uh, trade outcome. Uh, and yet they're also the same sectors that are massively important to Scotland. And they are the sectors that are still heavily reliant on agricultural support. So in many senses, uh, you know, that, that, that does expose Scotland in, in ways that maybe the rest of the United Kingdom isn't because we have a far greater interest in those particular products and how important they are to our agricultural economy. James. Uh, convener, uh, I just wanted to ask 
Dr Campbell about a point in his paper you addressed the issue of inflation uh, post Brexit and I'm just interested in terms of the, the Scottish budget come up coming up what you see as a particular pressure points because of the, the recent inflation changes and what options are open to the Scottish Government in terms of addressing the pressure points in relation to inflation? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the rise in inflation, which from the, the forecasts at the budget last week, is not going to get below 2% for the next few years. So you know, it's kind of going to be potentially above it. And it could, it could potentially go higher depending on what happens during the Brexit negotiations. So if it looks like it's going to be, be a hard Brexit and we don't get continued membership of the single market, the customs union, then the pound, I think, is going to depreciate further. Uh, which will cause uh, you know more inflationary pressure, and basically what it means is you know for the for the Scottish government, what what their budget can actually buy them is is a lot less. Uh, so they're, they're going to have to make uh, a number of tough decisions, especially given the, the pressure which are now on on wages in the public sector as well. You know the wages have been uh, flat, well, in real terms declining. Uh, really over the last 10 years, so there's a lot of pressure now to to increase wages in in the public sector. But your ability to do that. Is going to be constrained because it means you've got to cut services, you know. So moving into sort of like twenty, twenty one, twenty two, well, can you actually afford to continue to to subsidise to see uh, agriculture in the way we have in the past, given the pressures which 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 are on your budgets, uh, you know? So the outlook in terms of of uh, our economy, uh, both at a UK level and at a Scottish level, is is not is not particularly good, uh, to, to put it mildly. And, and do you think then, given those pressures, that the government have got to have a serious look at what taxation options that they've got in order to try and alleviate these pressures? Yeah. So I think, I mean, part of the problem, I suppose, for, for the Scottish government is that they, they don't actually have access to all of the fiscal tools that, uh, that the UK government has. Uh, so they've really only got, in terms of, of, of revenue raising, significant revenue raising money, uh, income tax. Uh, so... so but I, mean, I think they are actually looking at, you know, whether or not income tax rates in Scotland should should increase, uh, and you know the the bottom line is that if if you want to continue to provide the level of services, then it's probably going to be the case that income taxes won't will need to rise. Uh, whether you do that for for higher earners or you do it across the board, I think it then becomes a a, a political decision. Okay, I missed out anybody who wanted to ask a question in this session. I haven't done so. Thank you very much to our witnesses for coming along today. I'm very grateful. We now need to move suspend again for another couple of minutes just to allow you to change over witnesses, but it just will be a couple of minutes. Thank you.
The, the third item on our agenda today is to discuss the administration and collection of Scottish income tax um, from HMRC, and we're joined for the item today by Jim Hara, who's the Director General of Customer Strategy and Tax Design, and Sarah Walker, who's the Deputy Director for Devolution. And to begin the question sessions today, Alexander Burnett, please. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, and thank you for joining us. Um, if I could get straight into the uh, costs of running our new tax system. Um, in a parliamentary response to a colleague of mine, Bill Bowman, last week, uh, the Finance Secretary uh, said that the uh, system would cost about one and a half million a year to run if bans and rates were kept consistent with the rest of the UK. Uh, but he said, admitted that increasing the rates would cost the public purse more, saying a more significant divergence between the rates and bans that apply in Scotland when compared to the rest of the UK may lead to an increase in costs of up to five million. Uh, could you maybe comment on, on, on his comments, his answer, his parliamentary response, and, and give any more information as to is there any differing in costs between any of the proposals being put forward by the Scottish Government at the moment? Uh, yes, those are the uh, estimates of the costs, if I can explain. So first of all, uh, it, while rates and thresholds haven't diverged very much, we expect very low levels of contact from Scottish taxpayers about Scottish income tax issues in particular uh, and about their their uh, Scottish taxpayer status but if there is more divergence then uh, first of all you could expect more contact with people from people with queries but also uh, we would have to uh, look at what compliance work we would have to do to manage the risks that arise from divergence and that's where the five million pound estimate comes from uh, but they are just estimates and it would depend on the level and nature of the divergence, what kind of compliance plans we would put in place and what kind of costs we would we'd, we would formally estimate at the time. And so do you have different estimates for the different proposals being put forward? We, we've, we have been looking at the proposals in the discussion paper that's been published and working up what, you know, what our responses to those might be. We haven't uh, you know, come to any conclusions on those yet or shared any conclusions, but obviously the greater the divergence between uh, Scottish rates and thresholds and UK rates and thresholds, the more likely we are to see behavioural uh, effects, some of which would be non-compliant and therefore we would need a, a compliance response to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Patrick, efficiency? Uh, well, yes. Uh, good morning. It, it's really following on from the, the same uh, issue and the uh, obviously none of us would expect uh, you to offer a, a policy view about what is the, the preferable uh, position in, in terms of tax policy in, in Scotland, but we would all uh, be interested, I'm sure, in what the practical implications are for you uh, of the various options that have been uh, suggested uh, in the Scottish Government's paper, um, whether there is a, a variance between them in terms of the efficiency of, of tax collection under those scenarios, uh, and also just to, to pick up on this phrase you've, you've used about divergence. Uh, so far, of course, it's only the UK government which has uh, created any divergence by, ch by changing uh, the <laughs> threshold for the, the higher rate south of the border. That's where the, the only divergence has originated from. So it, it, in what sense do, do we uh, have, have this, this, this notion that it would be Scottish changes that create divergence? Uh, we simply have two different jurisdictions which are responsible for tax policies in two different areas. Uh, yes, I didn't intend to imply that it's just uh, decisions of the Scottish Parliament. It's just different decisions right. uh, will result in divergence, and those will uh, then give rise to differ different behavioural effects, some of which will be perfectly compliant and won't involve us in any extra uh, uh, costs in monitoring compliance, but some of which might, might not be. I mean, as far as the different options in the uh, discussion paper are concerned, we uh, can deliver any of them in, in administrative terms and stand ready to uh, do so. Um, you're, you're right that different options have got different administrative implications and therefore different cost uh, implications. Um, in particular, if new bans are, are added at the bottom, for example, if the basic rate ban was, was split, then we would have to think through some policy and administrative changes to cope with that because various reliefs are given at source at the basic rate and the, you know some things that currently happen automatically might actually require some intervention to make them uh, to make them work uh, in the future similarly if there are lots of uh, bands then there is you know, greater scope for people's uh, tax affairs in year for example in Peugeot are not 
uh, not to be quite right. And so when we do our reconciliation at the end of the year, you're, you're likely to get a higher number of underpayments and overpayments than you would if there's just a few uh, rate bands. But they're all capable of being administered. And I'm, I'm just wondering as well whether um, at an organisational level you've looked at uh, other countries which have uh, different income tax regimes uh, across different parts of, of uh, single states. I mean, the, uh, other European countries, uh, the, there are a number of areas where people would take, pay a different rate of income tax in different uh, sub-state jurisdictions. Is that something you've examined? Um, yes, we do look re regularly at, at, at the position in other countries. Other countries, a lot of other countries are different in the sense that they expect everybody to submit a tax return every year and we don't we have a PAYE system which is fairly sophisticated and tries to get the affairs of most people right at the end of the year without them having to complete a tax return so that is a difference between in administrative terms from um, the way that uh, other countries work but uh, certainly we've looked at in terms of the behavior of taxpayers in reaction to different tax rates in different parts of a country or even between different countries obviously we do study that and we, we learn from that and we, we, we take our and make our plans in the light of that experience okay I, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's any f further evidence that you could perhaps give us in, in writing afterwards that that demonstrates what you've learned about those those comparisons with other jurisdictions um, I'm not sure that there's anything specific in writing um, but we can have a look and see if there is it would be helpful. I mean, the, the, the debate over potential behavioural effects is, is one that uh, rattles back and forth every, every once in a while. Most of the evidence that I can find is pretty thin about the, the extent of those kind of behavioural effects. But if, if there is more out there, it would be useful to, to see. Yes, I, mean, I would expect it, uh, you know, the Scottish Fiscal Commission would have to make some judgments and assumptions about what those behavioural effects uh, would be. I understand that. Tell me, it's interesting, curious. If we know how much it's costing the Scottish Government to do some of these changes, when the UK Government changed the higher rate t t tax thresholds from 43 to 45,000, how much did that cost? Uh, I don't have a figure uh, for that. I mean, we do uh, cost all the policy changes that uh, Treasury ask us to make. We have uh, sort of within our baseline a certain amount of funding that is. Um, that we're expected to use for regular changes like uprating and things like that but specific policy changes as part of our advice to ministers ahead of a, a budget it includes what money we will need to uh, implement those measures and whether we can or cannot implement them within our existing uh, baseline funding. It would be helpful for us I think to get an understanding of what that was because if we've got to make a judgment in the future about where, whether the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament is getting best value from the HMRC, it would be there for, to see the whole picture, I think, would be helpful to us. So if you could write to us with that further information, that would, to, if, if it's available. Go away and see what's available and give okay. whatever it is. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Patrick, you, you concluded that? Yeah, area. Great, Willie, you. scrutiny. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning again to you. Um, I've had a look over the, the service level agreement that I've seen on several occasions now, but I wanted to ask about the role for scrutiny here. I don't see any direct uh, mention of opportunities to scrutinise the process for members of the committees of the Scottish Parliament. Do, do you see that as something that needs to be further developed in the, the agreement that's been reached between HMRC and the Scottish Government in this area? Um, we are, I think, one of the papers that we sent into the committee uh, for this hearing is a uh, sort of first, first annual report on our performance against the service level agreement. Now, it's fairly uh, sort of l limited at this stage because we've only had one year of operation. We haven't had a full cycle of the income tax. But um, uh, that, I think, is something we would expect to produce once a year, send to the committee, obviously, and that would be an opportunity for scrutiny. Do you, do you have a formal role to, to appear in front of, say, the Public Accounts Committee at Westminster on matters relating to, to tax, for example, but there's no equivalent requirement or expectation that you would appear in front of the Public Audit Committee, for example, in the Scottish Parliament? I have appeared before the Public Audit it's, Committee. Of it's the by Parliament. invitation, though, isn't it? There's no formal part of the scrutiny process for that to take place, though, as I understand it. I mean, I, I am formally uh, HMRC's accounting officer for uh, Scottish income tax, and therefore 
uh, account to the Scottish Parliament for that in the same way as uh, my chief executive would account to the Public Accounts Committee in Westminster for uh, the uh, for the UK income tax. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking at um, the paper in paragraphs 37, 38, 39, 40, and it's about review, monitoring, and reporting. But it's all about you know exchanges between directors and accountable officers. There's really no mention of the elected members of the. The Parliament and what their formal role in this process might be. I just ask you again: Is that something that you would welcome the opportunity to come to this committee or the Public Audit Committee to give more evidence as this process develops? Yes, I mean obviously the the document is a service level agreement between HMRC and the Scottish Government and sets out uh, you know what it is we have agreed with the Scottish Government we they can expect from us in terms of service levels and data exchange and they will be holding us to uh, account for that. But I'm quite happy. Uh, you know, to be scrutinised by uh, Committee of the Parliament about how we are performing against that uh, that agreement. That's not a problem. Thank you. And as, as Sarah has said, we will you know produce an annual report that summarises that. Thank you, Jim. Um, Ivan. Uh, thanks, convener. Thanks for coming along to talk to us this morning. Um, the, the main questions I want to focus on was around about data availability. But I might want to come back and do a wee bit more digging on the, the cost of, of, of changes uh, to the tax bans as well later on. Um, so it was really around about, um, clearly there's, there's a complex um, situation here in terms of the, um, uh, the, the tax structure we have now vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the Scottish Government's policies and the outturn from that and relative to what happened in the rest of the UK and what that means in the fiscal framework, etc. Um, now... Clearly, at one level, we'll get complete outturn data at some point, several months after the final deadline in January for um, self-assessments being submitted. Then you do some number crunch, and then we get something back, which means for 17-18, we're probably up at the end of 2019 before we get get the full the full picture or well through 2019. Um, what I'm keen to understand is what data are are we can we see or are we seeing. At a government level at the moment um, on the kind of monthly performance of the tax. Now, clearly at that stage, you only know what's happening with pay as you earn, um, but to be fair, that's going to be the, the biggest part of, of, of what uh, what the tax take is. And you're really looking, obviously, for variations between what you thought was going to happen and what, what is happening on a kind of seasonal adjusted basis, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of where are we um, in terms of getting that data at the moment? Is that getting delivered month by month to the Scottish Government? Yes, we, right. have, we are working with the Scottish Government. We've done quite a lot of work with the, between st statisticians to make sure that we understand that data. We now have a, an arrangement with the Scottish Government to give them that monthly data in respect to Scottish taxpayers. It's, as you, as you say, it's of limited value because it's only a partial, partial picture and it's, uh, it may have some lags in terms of the identification of the Scottish taxpayers. But it is... A, a good way, the best way we have of establishing any trends and, as you say, any divergence from it from forecast. Um, those figures are being uh, looked at by, by both us and Scottish Government each month as they come through. We do hope to publish that series in the future, but I think we want to get a bit of exp a bit of experience of the figures and make sure we understand them before we make them a public a public okay. document. No, that's great to hear that. I suppose the next question, following up on the, the scrutiny aspect, is at, at what point? Does this committee get to look at those? Um, but, but understand what you're saying. You need to establish some confidence in the process, but that might be something that we'll follow up as as a committee, probably directly with the Scottish government, to see what we can we can get access to on an ongoing basis. I certainly, think over time, as you get a, a sort of a data series, that it'll be more valuable. Yeah. Uh, so we will we'll do the final reconciliation about 15 months after the end of the uh, tax year, and you know, as time goes on, we'll be able to identify much more closely where the correlations do and do not exist uh, between that sort of monthly data that uh, that you get and that final picture. So I, I would expect, you know, initially there will be some uh, concerns about, you know, how how you can really tell what it is it's telling you because of the limitations in it. I mean, some examples of those as are, as you say, it doesn't include self-assessment uh, data, which accounts for about 14% of Scottish income tax. Also, it, it, it is at a point in time, so someone can appear to be a Scottish taxpayer or not a Scottish taxpayer at a point in time in the tax year, but actually it's a test for the tax year as a whole, so you only know after the uh, end of it. And also in our pay as you earn codes are adjustments for certain reserved 
uh, matters which wouldn't flow through to Scottish income tax. Uh, and it'll take us a bit of time to gain confidence in what that data does and does not tell you and what level of confidence you can take in it. But it, I think that will grow over time. Fine, thanks. And another thing I was going to do, as I said, was do a bit more digging on this potential cost of, of policy changes that the Scottish Government may implement. Um, and I understand you're not going to sit here and give us give us a number, but I suppose we'd be keen to understand what kind of magnitude might we be talking about? Um, or if you can't give us that, at what point would you be able to tell us that? Because clearly, if we're going to make a tax change and the Scottish Government's going to raise 100 million, but you're going to charge them 20 million for implementing it, then clearly that's a, a, a important. If it's only going to cost you a million to implement it, then that's a different kind of, different kind of decision. So is there any sense on the magnitude of that? Kinds of areas where I think we probably uh, could give a re you know a reasonable amount of certainty are around the IT changes because, as the convener said, you know we make IT changes uh, for the UK government as well, and we should be able to get some uh, sort of uh, confidence around costings there. What are less known really is how customers are going to respond to changes. So how many of them are going to ring us or write to us asking asking uh, queries or asking for explanations of what's happening to them. I, mean, I think it's fair to say that to date we have probably overestimated the costs of uh, administering Scottish uh, income tax and that we have not seen the levels of contact that we had sort of on a contingency basis planned for. Um, so that's the area where there would be much more estimation and could turn out to be you know, quite significantly wrong um, over time. So, that, so the reality is even at the point where we make policy decisions, we may not even know the answer it, to that question. It will, be an, it will always be an estimate at that point. At some at point, point later on. Yeah. OK, okay thanks. Murdo identification. Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, I just want to ask about um, the issue of Scottish taxpayer identification, which I think we've looked at in this committee before. Um, you've given us quite a lot of information uh, around the work you're doing in this area. Uh, what would you estimate is the, the margin of error we're currently working towards in terms of you know, being able to accurately assess people with an S code? I mean, we, we feel we've got a very high level of confidence uh, that we have identified uh, Scottish taxpayers on our systems. So um, having put that flag on our systems for people with Scottish addresses, we have done work then to corroborate the accuracy of our address uh, database against a number of other uh, data sets. And we've been able to have a very high level of corroboration. We've corroborated about 98 to 99 percent of those addresses. Uh, that doesn't mean the other one to two percent are wrong. It just means that they're not uh, corroborated. Uh, and in a number of instances, we found that the address data that we hold it is actually more up to date than a lot of the data sets that we uh, uh, compare it with. Um, I think the next, so that so that I think means it's a never-ending job, and we've got to improve in that all of the, all the time, and we've got to maintain it because obviously people are moving address all the time. Um, but uh, you know, I think that I think we've got that level of corroboration. The other work that we're doing is comparing uh, the flags in our systems with uh, payrolls, for example, the Scottish Government and some other large uh, employers to make sure, and against a set of number of scenarios to try and identify, well, are, are there people for whom we don't hold a Scottish address, but actually they are uh, living in Scotland. And again, we find very, very, very low levels of, of sort of non-corroboration there. Uh, what we're going through at the moment is uh, you know, working with employers to make sure that the flags on our system have fed through to S codes that they are operating in their pay, in their payroll, uh, and there are some uh, you know payroll software that are you know that don't pick up all of that, and that would not uh, impact on the at a fiscal level on uh, uh, Scottish government because we would nevertheless calculate the correct amount of tax because we've got the flag on our system, but it could mean that those taxpayers have a, an underpayment or an overpayment at the end of the year. And as Sarah said, the aim of Pays Your is to get people's tax affairs right as the year goes on. So we are doing those checks now uh, during the course of this year as part of our employer compliance checks to make sure that everyone's payroll is working as it should. Um, but our estimate of 2.6 million uh, Scottish taxpayers is, is staying firm. OK, thank you. Um, I see from your paper you have a wealthy taxpayer unit. That sounds like a happy place to, to be working. Um, uh, clearly, you're putting you know, extra uh, attention on that. Have you had any cases of individuals disputing whether they have an S code? 
We haven't had a single dispute uh, so far from a taxpayer who argues that they are who, who argues that they are not a Scottish taxpayer when we have said okay. that they are. I am aware of one case uh, of someone who expressed disappointment that they had not been flagged uh, as a Scottish taxpayer. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately for you, when we looked into it, they weren't a Scottish taxpayer. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you. Ash. Good morning. Um, I'm interested in this idea, I suppose it's based around possible future divergence and behaviour change. So let's say there was a tax, and I understand as well there's no legal obligation for people to make you aware of their correct address, is that right? So let's just say somebody then told you they'd moved away from Scotland. How are you going to ensure that that, that, that is genuine? What sort of checks will you carry out to, to ensure that's correct? Um, well... In the, we we do these matching exercises. So we, uh, at, at, at the sort of macro level, we will take our whole database of Scottish addresses, um, ma compare it with uh, the addresses that other people hold. So retailers, electoral roll, that kind of thing. If that comes up with a discrepancy, then we will contact the taxpayer to try and follow that up and make sure that we know where they really live. Uh, for the people at the high end of the spectrum, the high, high earners, we have a much more sort of personal uh, relationship with them. Uh, so we will, um, we've already started sort of reviewing the people that we think um, might have more than one residence, for instance, or more than one home. And we're also we're thinking about how we would tackle those sorts of cases. So we have two, sort of two levels of things: one for the one for the mass market, if you like, and one for the high earners. I think. That Sorry, to, Sorry. Uh, just to say that at the moment where there is a very low level of risk that people will uh, game the system, that gives us an opportunity of establishing a baseline. And so we are you know, doing a lot of work to make sure we understand that baseline so that uh, you know, we can monitor trends in the future against it as, as rules change. I suppose what I'm, I'm sort of envisaging a, a potential scenario into the sort of medium term uh, where you identify someone that should have been flagged up as a, as a Scottish taxpayer, but it isn't. Um, if, if you felt that somehow they'd given you the wrong information, um, maybe on purpose, if you like, would you be looking into the idea of penalties for that to dissuade that sort of behaviour? Um, absolutely. So while you're correct that there is no legal obligation on anyone to uh, tell us a change of address, if someone does tell us their uh, address and claim they live there and that is untrue, then that is tax evasion and existing uh, powers both to go back into earlier years to recover the tax and interest but also to penalise them apply to that. Thanks. Supplementary. Sorry, can I just double check the, the two approaches that Sarah Walker was talking about there uh, about the, 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 the high end and, and what you described as the mass market. What's the cut off point? Is that the, the additional rate you're talking about or is there a different cut off point between those two approaches? Uh, they are the people, the, the, the sort of personal relationship with the people who um, are looked after by a high net worth unit. I'm afraid I don't know the. I think, I mean, we have you know yeah. So we have two. We've actually got two levels of uh, people. So we've got uh, affluent, uh, who I think that is the over the 150,000 level, and they get a you know an extra uh, bit of attention. But then the high net worth, I can't remember the exact figures, but it is really you know very wealthy uh, people, and not necessarily based on their income. It can be based on their uh, on on their capital wealth. They have a. Uh, compliance manager appointed to them who is expected to get get to know their affairs individually and uh, bless you, and um, uh, and keep track of you know what they are doing and what their attitudes to tax compliance are and you know what advisors they uh, engage and and sort of manage them on a case-by-case -case basis but I don't have the exact uh, sort of criteria for that with me. I can that, that's you know. fine. It helps, it helps to give a picture. Thank you. I was interested um, to note from the National Audit Office the report which came out this week. It said two things. Paragraph 16, it said the biggest challenge facing HMRC is maintaining the accurate address records of Scottish taxpayers. It then went on to say neither taxpayer nor employer are legally required to tell HMRC of changes of address. Now, that might not have been necessary previously because we were in terms of the tax process, because we were all in, effectively under the same jurisdiction. The Scottish Government has no powers to, in the devolved sense, to deal with that issue. Is that it's something that HMRC are considering, whether or not there should be a legislative requirement to tell about tax changes? And if not, why not? I think, it, I think it is something we would keep under review. First of all, there are a couple of areas where there are obligations. Employers are obliged to give us uh, addresses for new employees. 
uh, and in addition, people in self-assessment uh, are required to uh, confirm their uh, their address, um, which is populated on their return. Um, but you're right that un you know until now we've not had to uh, place a legal obligation on uh, people, and it hasn't been necessary. I think the level of corroboration in to date in our address data suggests that we don't have a problem uh, because obviously any legal obligation and the penalties and everything that flow with it you would, would have to be proportionate to some problem but uh, you know we are in a new situation where uh, where you live within the UK you know Scotland England Wales Northern Ireland will be relevant to the level of tax that you have to pay and it's something I think we would keep under review but at the moment I think we feel that we've got good processes for keeping track of where people uh, are okay Ivan yeah, Based on, on the same point, but just also to expand that, because clearly the individuals you'll be talking about in, in large part will be working through an accountant or an agent or somebody will be submitting on their behalf. So it's what kind of dialogue or guidelines have, have been issued there or conversations have been had with, uh, with agents? So uh, quite extensive, particularly on the need to keep us up to date uh, with where people live. Um, we issue... You know, quite apart from the engagement we have day to day with agents, we issue about six bulletins a year to them, and in those bulletins we remind them that it is important that they keep us up to date with the with where their uh, uh, clients are living. And as I said, the most wealthy of them, you would expect our compliance managers to be having one to one dialogue with the agents very uh, frequently. Uh, in our early work, uh, we did identify because obviously with the the high net worth individuals, it's likely that they have more than one uh, home very often uh, they can have several addresses that they can use and in our early work to establish the uh, identity of Scottish taxpayers we did identify 2,000 cases where people had a, a, a correspondence address but another address that they said was their main home which was outside Scotland and we looked into all of those uh, cases and we found in fact that you know there was they were all fine and uh, that the address that the people had identified as their main home was indeed their their main home. So we do, we do monitor that. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jim and Sarah, for coming along today. It's very helpful in terms of just beginning the uh, process of scrutinising the, 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 the budget and eventually, obviously, the Scottish budget will be published on the 14th of December, I think, if I'm correct. So thank you very much for coming along. Uh, I now, and that was a final item on the agenda, so I now close this meeting. <laughs> <laughs>